Good morning. It's April 2nd, just after 9 o'clock. We're here for a council session, and we are going to begin with a proclamation recognizing Child Abuse Prevention Month by Councilmember Sidney Katz. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for being with us. April is National Child Abuse Prevention Month. And as we begin, I'm going to ask the crowd behind me to please introduce themselves. You're, you're welcome to stay. <laughs> Would you please introduce Hi, I'm Francia Davis. I'm from Voices for Children Montgomery. Hi, Debbie Feinstein, Chief of the Special Victims Division for the Montgomery County State's Attorney's Office. Charlie Regan, the director of the Treehouse Child Advocacy Center. Assistant Chief Nicholas Augustine, Montgomery County Police. Captain Jeffrey Bungie, Special Victims Investigations Division, Montgomery County Police. Oscar Mensah, Social Services Officer for Montgomery County. Lisa Merkin, Senior Administrator, Child Welfare Services. Hey, good morning, James Bridgers, the Director of the Department of Health and Human Services. Good morning, I'm Corey Talcott, Division Chief from the Office of the County Attorney. Good morning, Larissa Royal, Child Welfare Services. Good morning, Patricia Spann, Child Welfare Services. Well, thank you all for being here, and thank you for all that you do. I know <clears throat> you never get enough thanks for the good hard work that you do for all of us. Child abuse can leave deep, lasting scars, making it harder to learn in school, to form trusting relationships, to build self-esteem, and to escape cycles of long-term abuse. Montgomery County is extremely fortunate to have the county's child welfare services in the Department of Health and Human Services, focusing on preventing child abuse and neglect. In addition, we are highlighting two nonprofits working to protect their children, Treehouse Child Advocacy Center and Voices for Children, Montgomery. Treehouse Child Advocacy Center is dedicated to reducing trauma, and promoting healing for child and adolescent victims of sexual abuse, physical abuse, and neglect. Voices for Children recruits, screens, and trains close to 200 local volunteers each year to serve as court-appointed special advocates for abused and neglected children and those in foster care. Montgomery County's <clears throat> excuse me, child abuse and neglect a 24-hour reporting hotline is 240-777-4417. We should observe this month to promote the safety and well-being of all children and families and to recognize the child welfare professionals who work tirelessly to protect their children. We're going to hear first from Charlie Reagan from Treehouse. We're then going to hear from Francia Davis for Voices for Children, and then I'll read the proclamation. Please. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Councilman Katz, and thank you for your support over the years has been invaluable to the work that all of us do for the children of Montgomery County. Uh, the Treehouse Child Advocacy Center stands as a voice for those who too often have suffered in silence, innocent children who have endured the unspeakable horrors of abuse. Child Abuse Awareness Month is a time for all of us as a community to come together and shine a light on this dark reality that still plagues our society. At the Treehouse, our mission is clear, to provide a safe haven for those vulnerable children, a place where they can begin to heal from this unimaginable trauma that they have endured. Every day we witness at the Treehouse the resilience and strength of these children in the face of adversity, and that inspires us to work even harder in our fight against child abuse. But awareness alone is not enough. We must take action. We must educate ourselves and others about the signs of abuse, empower every member of our community to speak out and take a stand against this injustice. We must continue to support all of these organizations like the Treehouse that provide vital services to abuse children and their families, ensuring they have the resources they need to heal and thrive. 
So together, we can break the cycle of abuse and create a world where every child in Montgomery County feels safe, loved, and protected. So during this month, let us show those who have suffered that they are not alone. Let each of us be their advocates, their champions, and their voices of hope in a world that too often has turned a blind eye to their pain. So thank you in the county. Thank you. Uh, Voices for Children Montgomery has been providing volunteer advocates for children in foster care since 1987. We have now recruited, trained, and screened uh, and provided ongoing supervision and support to over 2,600 um, volunteers serving children who have been abused or neglected. And we have done all that with strong county support and cooperation from our wonderful Child Welfare Department over the years. Thank you. Uh, yes, this a pinwheel is pinwheel is a symbol of child abuse prevention month. Um, it's a movement, and so there are uh, programs all over the country who are planting pinwheel gardens today to recognize child abuse prevention month. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> this is a proclamation. Whereas child abuse and neglect is a serious problem affecting every segment of our community and finding solutions requires input and action from everyone. And whereas child abuse can have long-term psychological, emotional, and physical effects that have lasting consequences for victims of abuse and their families, <clears throat> excuse me, and whereas in Montgomery County, we want to eliminate the risk of child abuse and promote the social, emotional, and developmentally well-being of our most vulnerable population, our children, and whereas a cycle of child abuse can be broken with early intervention, which is essential to ensure that an abused child or adolescent develops into a healthy and productive adult capable of forming trusting and loving relationships. And whereas Montgomery County is fortunate to have nonprofits and county services dedicated to reducing trauma and promoting healing for child and adolescent victims of sexual abuse, physical abuse, and neglect. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the County Council of Montgomery County, Maryland, hereby proclaims April 2024 as Child Abuse Prevention Month. And be it further resolved that the County Council encourages residents to recognize this month by dedicating yourselves to the task of improving the quality of life for all children and families and raising awareness about child abuse prevention. And it's signed by the Council President, Andrew Freitzen, and myself. Thank you all very, very much. We're going to give you one, and we will give you one. You. Thank you to Councilmember Katz for recognizing Child Abuse Prevention Month. We're now going to move on to our next proclamation, recognizing Fair Housing Month, which I will be presenting along with Director Stowe, who is going to represent the county executive who couldn't make it this morning. And all of our guests who are here to join for the Fair Housing Month proclamation, please join us.
Good morning. I see that the county executive has, in fact, joined us. Uh, we're here to celebrate Fair Housing Month, which uh, is now in its 56th year. Uh, on April 11th, 1968, the Fair Housing Act ensured that no one was discriminated against concerning the sale, rental, and financing of housing based on race, religion, and national origin or uh, uh, sex. Signed into law exactly one week after the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. Passage of the Fair Housing Act was a step towards the vision of the type of beloved community that Martin Luther King Jr. talked about, a dream and a vision that we are still aspiring to work towards. We celebrate the Fair Housing Act today, recognizing that we still have work to do to ensure that there is access to dignified housing for everybody uh, in our community, that we eliminate discrimination on the basis of uh, 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 of someone's identity. Uh, with that, really pleased to be here with the county executive. So I'm going to turn to him uh, for a few remarks, and then we'll turn it to Director Stowe, uh, and then to our guests to introduce themselves. Thank you. So this is a really important uh, landmark, um, but the you know the work still needs to be done. We still hear about housing discrimination. We know that, uh, for example, no one's supposed to be discriminated against if they have vouchers, but we know there are landlords who still don't honor vouchers when tenants present vouchers. So the work has to continue. This is really important, Montgomery County. It comes on the heels of when the county and when the state eliminated um, the ability to discriminate in housing and it then broke the covenants up. Any of us who've lived in Montgomery County long enough, you can go back and look at your property and you go back and look at your deeds and you'll see covenants that didn't allow you to sell a house to a black person, in many communities a Jewish person, and a few communities even a Catholic person. And so the elimination of the covenants opened up the housing market technically so people could actually buy a house in these neighborhoods. And that was really important for folks. A lot of folks who come out of um, D.C. were working and had wanted opportunities in Montgomery County like everybody else had and weren't able to get them. So fair housing marked a landmark for Montgomery County. It meant we were serious. We actually didn't rely on other people to do this. We took our own leadership in moving forward on the Fair Housing Act. And I think, you know, by and large, it's been beneficial, but we still have work to do. So I'm really happy to be here today. It's a good thing to be celebrating. And uh, thank you. Director Stowe. Thank you so much, uh, Council President Friedson and members of council and the county executive. Uh, we felt today was so very important, Council Member Friedson, uh, to make sure, sure that people understand that the very core value of our community is about where people live. Their sense of shelter, their sense of refuge. It becomes critically important that they know that in Montgomery County, that opportunity to obtain that kind of opportunity for themselves and their families does exist without the kind of barriers that may exist vis-a-vis -vis through practices that are discriminatory. So we've assembled today all the folks who were involved in that process, from those who are housing providers, for those who are in the sale of real estate, as well as those who, in fact, are advocates. And so I've asked them to come just real, real quickly to share a quick moment with you about their perspective. And I want to be able to share with our community that we all are supportive of this to our council members. We are all in this together. This is not them and us. Every aspect of ensuring that housing core value is available to our community is, in fact, available for everybody's perspective, regardless of their particular part that they play in providing housing for members of our community. And so I'm going to ask them to come real, real quickly and just share a little bit about this, about what they're doing. But I want to share with you who was actually here. Um, we've got then Commissioner, uh, actually, our vice chair is here. Uh, there she is, Commissioner uh, Dark. Uh, she's here. Also, our commissioner, uh, uh, Janice Freeman, is here with us. Uh, there she is. Uh, Montgomery County Branch and NAACP is here. Denise Johnson and Cherie Branson. Uh, the Greater Capital Area Association of Realtors President, Christopher Serrano, is here. Uh, Department of Housing and Community Affairs, Scott Bruton is here. Thank you, Scott. Uh, Reynolds Alliance is here. Matt Losax. The Greater Metropolitan Association of Realtors is here. Michelle Hagens, and our housing, housing advocate, uh, Jackie Simon. And so I've asked us a couple of them to say a quick word, Mr. President. Jackie, you start first with us. There we go. Altitude mode 
challenged. <laughs> 1968, 56 years ago, 56 years ago, where were you then? I was a newcomer to Montgomery County, a young wife with two small children from rural Ohio. It was here I learned what discrimination was. It wasn't that it wasn't in Ohio, it just presented a different face here. I promptly joined Suburban Maryland Fair Housing and shortly thereafter became a commissioner of the Human Rights Commission of the county. Montgomery County has led the way in many areas of fair housing, but we can't rest on our laurels. There is much left to do. Voucher holders encounter landlords who know better, but with a wink and a nod, turn people away, and the victim doesn't even know it. Do our laws need to be stronger or more precise? We still allow homes to be built that separate and divide us, isolating those with different abilities and needs. I believe we can do better there too. Together we can do better to create the community we want to grow old in and then leave it even better and stronger than we found it. It's together that we accomplish the dream we all share. Thank you. All right, for coming down to NAACP. Good morning, I'm Cherie Branson, third vice president of the NAACP. I wanna thank you all for being here. Let me just say that the NAACP has been standing against housing discrimination for a very long time, um, from the removal of restrictive covenants to our current concern about um, source of income, as well as the um, disparate uh, use of appraisals and how they adversely affect black homeowners. So we are here, thank you very much for having this, uh, but the struggle continues and, and we will continue to fight. Thank you. G. Carr. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning. My name is Christopher Saran. I'm the 2024 president of the Greater Capital Area Association of Realtors, representing over 11,000 realtors and industry professionals in our area. I want to thank County Executive Elrich and County President Friedson and the entire council for this opportunity to affirm the importance of fair housing in our community. GCAR is very proud with our continuing work to forward our mission of fair housing for all with the Realtor Code of Ethics that ensures fair housing for more protected classes than the current Fair Housing Act itself. We also require every member of our board of directors and our committees, which are hundreds of positions, to complete our diversity, equity, and inclusion champions program to ensure that our association is guided by this important lens. GCAR is, was recently honored by the Maryland Realtors for being leaders in the state of Maryland in that regard as well. While we are here, it is vital that we not only support fair housing, but that we support housing development. Our marketplace is depleted, and we know that to act and deliver for our community is for healthy housing stock. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I didn't mention Greater Metropolitan Association of Realtors, a real TIST, actually, is the name of it. Michelle Higgins, President. Ms. Higgins. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, the Greater Metropolitan Association of Realtists Incorporated, also known as GMAR, is pleased to join hands with all organizations assembled here today, including the Montgomery County Office of Human Rights. As we come together to celebrate the National uh, Fair Housing Month, uh, this year we gather under the theme, Fair Housing, the Act in Action.
National Fair Housing Month holds profound significance for Realtors members, representing the commitment of NARAB, which is the National Association of Real Estate Brokers, to enforce the principles of fair housing. Established in 1947, NARAB was founded to provide membership to black real estate professionals who were denied entry into the National Association of Realtors, also known as NAR. Led by 11 men and one woman, our founding fathers and mother of fair housing were instrumental in shaping the landscape of housing equality. Their tireless efforts contributed to the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1968 now known as the Fair Housing Act, a landmark legislation that continues to serve as the cornerstone of fair housing practices today. GMAR proudly stands as the 111th local board of NARAB located right here in Montgomery County, Maryland, a nonprofit advocacy organization committed to enhancing the business conditions of our members and promoting equity, democracy, and affordable housing initiatives within the real estate industry. We advocate for fairness in all aspects of housing, striving to combat homelessness and promote home ownership opportunities throughout the DMV region. Region. We are focused on making fair housing the act in action. We promote um, democracy in housing, and for NARAB and GMAR, that means having access to housing, education about housing, being able to leverage housing as a financial tool, and empowering our communities to build wealth through purchasing real estate. It's a great time to be a realtor, and some of the things that we have will be offering and have offered um, is GMAR has partnered with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to offer, um, to address the appraisal biases. We've offered workshops on how to become an appraiser um, to also uh, counter the um, low home, home, black home ownership rates. We have also uh, partner will also offer the Building Black Wealth Tours Community Days, and GMAR will be offering four of those this year. And to also address the low inventory of, of, um, of housing dwellings available for, for our um, communities, we will be, um, well, NARAB has created a Black Developers Academy which will also address um, the low numbers of developers in the community. We are excited and, and ready to move forward in being change agents and solution uh, makers for this county and throughout the nation. Again, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you very much. Up again, Matt, come on up. Talk about the renters. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Council President Friedson, Council Executive Mark Elrich for this important proclamation this morning. My name is Matt Losak. I'm the co-founder and executive director of the Montgomery County Renters Alliance. We are also the leading co-founders of Renters United in Maryland. Uh, we have seen housing discrimination, not just in Montgomery County, but across the state. But it's nearly impossible for many renters who are facing eviction to defend against it when we do not have just cause eviction protection. Today, the Maryland Senate will consider legislation to create local enabling protections for renters that will require a landlord or property manager to state the reason to evict somebody from their home. Right now, without that protection, with just 60 days notice, a landlord or property manager can evict a tenant without having to state any reason at all. Imagine what kind of discrimination this could hide. We are seeing it now. One of our tenants is testifying today before the Judicial Proceedings Committee who is being victimized with eviction for forming a tenants association and because the property manager doesn't like the color of his skin. We are sure of this, but it's very difficult for us to prove it without this protection. Enforcement of all kinds, enforcement of uh, unjust eviction is extremely important to balance uh, the terms of renters and landlords so that they have a relationship for stable housing and to end the kind of discrimination that continues to this day. I thank you all for recognizing this day. I thank all of those for the decades of work that went into creating a fair housing understanding in this country, but we've got a lot of work to do. Thank you. 
Thank you. Fair housing is a team sport. It's great to have so many members of the team who are here today who are part of this effort that is ongoing. I'm going to read the proclamation with the county executive. Whereas the month of April is National Fair Housing Month, and this year marks the 56th anniversary of the federal fair housing law, which was passed in 1968 to eliminate discriminatory housing practices. And Whereas Montgomery County has long been a leader in the commitment to ensuring equal opportunity for all and its efforts to provide public awareness, training, and enforcement of fair housing practices to those in the industry and county residents and Whereas residents and housing professionals across Montgomery County are encouraged to participate in activities which further fair housing awareness and Whereas this year's national theme is fair housing the act in action and we re reaffirm our commitment to ensuring fair access to housing for all Montgomery County residents and Whereas the Montgomery County Office of Human Rights and the Interagency Fair Housing Coordinating Group have the responsibility and the authority to remove barriers to housing choices, to investigate complaints about housing discrimination, and to foster a climate of fair and equal access to housing options in the county for all of our residents. Now, therefore, be it resolved that Mark Elrich as County Executive, Andrew Friedson as Council President of Montgomery County, Maryland, hereby proclaim the 56th anniversary celebration of the Federal Fair Housing Act of 1968 in Montgomery County, Maryland, signed on this second day of April on behalf of the entire council in 2024. Let's take a picture. Thank you to the Office of Human Rights, to all of our guests, to everybody who makes fair housing and puts it into action each and every day in Montgomery County. I really appreciate it. Before we go on to general business, I did just want to acknowledge and express the condolences uh, from myself and from the whole council to Larry Levitan, longtime state senator in Montgomery County, the longest serving chair of the Budget and Tax Committee who served in that role for 16 years, served in the Maryland Senate for 30 years, who, who recently passed, was a great champion for bringing Montgomery County funding and, and support for some of the most important uh, community-based uh, initiatives and, and uh, entities that we have in Montgomery County. And so we express our condolences to him and thank his family for all of the service that he provided to Montgomery County. And also wanted to express our condolences to all of the victims of the Key Bridge collapse. We haven't gathered since that horrific morning where we saw uh, those tragic events and want to express our appreciation to all of the first responders uh, not only in Baltimore, but including in Montgomery County and throughout the state who have stepped up to respond, as well as the governor, the, the mayor, the president, all the federal agencies who have uh, helped with that uh, challenging uh, situation uh, as well. With that, we're now going to move on to general business. Madam Clerk, are there any announcements? <laughs> Good morning, Council President, Vice President, and Council Members. A public hearing will be held Tuesday, April 16th, 2024 at 1.30 p.m. for multiple new projects under consideration by the County Council for inclusion in the FY25 capital budget and the FY25 to 30 capital improvements program. 
These items are listed on today's agenda, which can be found on the County Council's website. Also, the public hearing for sectional map amendment H150 has been moved to April 30th, 2024 at 1.30 p.m. and will take place here at the Council Hearing Room in the Council Office Building. The purpose of sectional map amendment H150 is to implement, implement the approved and adopted Fairland and Briggs-Cheney Master Plan zoning recommendations. Finally, Council Member Albernose is expected to join today's meeting virtually later this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The minutes from the March 5th and March 12th, 2024 Council meetings have been circulated to colleagues. Are there any objections to approving these minutes? Seeing none, these minutes stand approved. Our first agenda item is a work session on the FY25 to 30 Capital Improvements Program for Montgomery County Public Schools. I see we have some MCPS and Board of Education representatives who have joined us and while they are making their way up, I will call on the chair of the Education and Culture Committee, Councilmember Jawanda, would you please share the recommendation of the committee? Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning. Um, and good morning to our MCPS colleagues. Uh, the Education and Culture Committee held four work sessions uh, on the MCPS CIP. I want to thank the teams uh, from MCPS and from OMB uh, and our council dynamic duo, uh, Mr. Levchenko and Ms. McGuire, uh, for their work uh, on, on this as well as my own staff. Uh, the committee focused on prioritizing sy systemic infrastructure projects, which was different uh, since I've been on the council, I think probably in a while, and, and, uh, and right-sizing the out-year funding of key projects based on non-recommended reduction scenarios provided by MCPS, and they provided two. And to their credit, one of them also suggested this approach, which is what the committee went with. Uh, during our discussions, the committee reviewed the needs of each of these schools. We thought it was important to, and this was another thing that we had not done before in my, in my time on the committee, including demographics, capacity, uh, and general building condition. They were all scored and ranked. And we had extensive discussions about the staging and components of projects to maximize our resources and efforts through the MCPS CIP. Uh, we all we were joined by several colleagues, district colleagues and others, and we, and we recognized the challenges and the struggles of individual schools uh, and the school community at large has faced with delays to projects. No one likes to hear their project's going to happen and then it doesn't. We all have, have seen that. We believe that these recommendations from the committee, which were unanimous, can ensure funding for current and future projects that they remain on schedule with the necessary funding. So uh, the unanimous recommendations are summarized as follows and the dynamic duo will correct me if I get anything wrong. The committee recommends using the MCPS non-recommended non-recommend reduction scenario A as, as a starting point for our adjustments to the Board of Education's original request. It's always important to say the board would love to have everything done uh, we asked them for non-recommended reductions and they sent us two scenarios. The committee recommends the following projects for approval as requested by the board. Burtonsville Elementary School Replacement, LELEC at Broad Acres Elementary School Replacement, Crown High School, New, Greencastle Elementary as an addition, Highland View Elementary as an addition, William Tyler Page Elementary as an addition, Silver Spring International Middle School as an addition, Nielsville Middle School Major Capital Project, Poolsville High School Major Capital Project, Northwood High School Facility Upgrade, Woodward High School Reopening, and Piney Branch Elementary School Major Capital Project for planning funds. For the elementary major capital projects, the committee recommends maintaining planning funds as requested starting in FY25 and shifting construction placeholder funds, $3 million for each project to FY29 for the following four projects. Cold Spring Elementary, Damascus Elementary, Twinbrook Elementary, and Whetstone Elementary. For secondary major capital projects, the committee recommends the following. And these two had extensive discussion. Uh, shifting Damascus High School construction to FY29 with a completion date to be determined, removing funding for Magruder High School to be considered in the future, removing funding for the fuller renovation of Wooten High School to a later phase, 
And I just want to say uh, for the Damascus High School, the committee discussed the importance of ensuring that the high school students continue to have access. We had a lot of discussion on this uh, to the automotive certification program as part of their career readiness pathways. The committee requested that MCPS provide a plan uh, for the continuation and expansion written plan and, and update the committee and the council for this expansion and the discussion of other career pathway strategies at Damascus. For Wooten, the committee maintains funding in FY25 and 26 to address exterior improvements and related ADA modifications. And MCPS reported that this work is scheduled for the summer of 2024 uh, and the summer of 2025. And that will address the bulk of outstanding ADA concerns, which we're very, we're ha very happy to hear. The committee also recommended that Eastern Middle School as a high priority for restoration, even though it wasn't included during the reconciliation process, to maintain a schedule as close to the Board of Education's requested schedule as possible. The committee did not recommend funding the following newly requested projects. Mill Creek Town Edition, James Hubert Blake Edition, and Paint Branch High School Edition. The committee did recommend that if Mill Creek Town Elementary School Edition as a priority for the highest priority for rest restoration during reconciliation, if possible, out of those three. The committee also recommended shifting funds for the planning for the new Bethesda Chevy Chase and Walter Johnson Cluster Elementary Schools to the out years of the CIP. Given the capacity and utilization data, data in those clusters, planning funds are not needed in FY26 and 25. The committee recommended investing an additional $211 million. So all the stuff, hard choices we made led to this, uh, that we're able to put an additional $211 million into key systemic infrastructure projects. This includes funding in the out years for HVAC, sustainability initiatives, fire safety upgrades, ADA compliance, improved safe access, and other critical infrastructure projects. Um, and I want to thank my colleagues for that. And then finally, uh, the committee recommended the following countywide and systemic infrastructure projects to be approved as the board requested. Carver Educational Services Center, Early Childhood Centers, Design and Construction Management, Facility Planning, Planned Life Cycle Asset Replacement, restroom renovations, roof replacement, school security systems, asbestos abatement, outdoor play space maintenance, stormwater discharge, and water quality man management. Did I miss anything? Mr. Lipchenko. I won't say you missed anything, but I did want to provide uh, some context for why we had to go through this exercise. Context um, is good. The executive's recommendation back in January in the CIP uh, was about $91 million less than what the board had proposed. Uh, and he had identified um, non-recommended reductions in terms of the years, but not in the specific projects. Uh, so, and this is not unusual, this is a, a process we've gone through for many years, the council is very familiar with it, but what it does require is that the council identify how to get to those numbers. And the first step of that process was that the committee recommended that the Board of Education and MCPS um, come, over, come back with some non-recommended reduction scenarios, which they did. Uh, so we, we started with a $91 million gap in right. those six years. Uh, on top of that, as, as you mentioned, there was an interest um, that's, that goes back to uh, discussions last fall about dealing with the systemic projects, especially in the out years. And uh, so that uh, effectively increased the goal of trying to find those additional resources. Uh, so as you mentioned, there was a scenario A and a scenario B. Scenario A, scenario B was more of a traditional uh, scenario of trying to just get to the numbers. Uh, scenario A did that further um, uh, uh, element of, uh, of finding more resources in the out years for the systemic projects. Uh, so that, that was the uh, impetus for all of this discussion that the committee had over these multiple work sessions. Appreciate that. Thank you. for We started with the deficit and we had to address that as well. Uh, and Ms. President, I would just allow Board President Silvestri and, and Dr. Felder if they have any comments. Absolutely. I was going to do the same. Yeah. So please. Good morning, buenos dias. Um, it's an honor to speak with you today about the challenging but important work we all face to finalize the Capital Improvements Plan budget that ensures excellent learning facilities while remaining grounded in fiscal responsibility. Speaking for myself and my board colleagues, it is my intent to advocate for the needs 
of our students and the schools in which they learn, but also to understand the importance of doing so based on the reality of what a prudent budget can accomplish. We must move forward and we promise to do so together with you to make the best choices for our students and for our county as a whole. We understand the significance of the work we do today, today together, and the collaboration necessary. We are committed to working with you to ensure that our students have access to the best possible learning facilities. I know this is what you want for our communities as well. I want to express our appreciation for your continued support and dedication to the students of Montgomery County. As we navigate these challenging times, we look forward to working together to create a brighter future for our students in our community. The details are many, and I know you will have many specific questions about all the projects and plans. We'll do our best to show you the value or the reality of each proposal we've made. With me today, is Interim Superintendent Dr. Felder and members of our facilities and planning staff. Thank you. I'll pass it on to Dr. Felder. Good morning and uh, thank you Council President Friedson, uh, Vice President Stewart and to the entire uh, Council. Um, thank you for this opportunity uh, to discuss the CIP and budget uh, to build and provide essential learning spaces for our students. I am mindful of our collective responsibility uh, to provide for our students and to do so in a very fiscally responsible way. Uh, together we have the duty uh, to ensure our students and staff have access to the best teaching and learning environments possible. It is also important for MCPS um, facilities that our facilities remain robust as they are part of what supports a thriving community both near and in the distant future. Indeed, we face unique challenges in this process, including fiscal restraints and construction delays, uh, very often impacted by items outside of our control, such as supply chain uh, disruptions and the rising cost of construction materials. Uh, these obstacles have resulted in adjustments uh, to our school construction and frankly, changes in our plans which understandably have raised concerns among families, staff, and students. Uh, the Board of Education and MCPS closely consider and examine each facility uh, in its, as it is currently and what any projections for the community may necessitate in the future. The proposed fiscal years 2025-2030 uh, capital improvement plan is the culmination of tireless planning and the dedication of the educational excellence of our students and the operational excellence of our school system. The Board of Education's requests, uh, totaling uh, almost two billion, uh, includes a range of essential projects to enhance the learning environments of our growing student body. From elementary uh, to high schools, these projects reflect our commitment to providing optimal learning spaces conducive to academic achievement and personal growth. Uh, the county executives recommended FY 2025-2030 CIP while aligned with the amended FY 2023-2028 CIP presents a financial landscape that necessitates difficult decisions. It includes non-recommended reductions, um, as was referenced already, and deferrals uh, that are never the goal, but often the compromise that keeps the district on the path to fulfilling our commitment, which is to provide an exceptional school building and learning environment for each and every student. As you finalize the capital improvements plan budget, I urge you to consider the students we serve when doing so, as I know you will. Our community is undergoing transformative growth characterized by new and recent constructions. It is important to ensure that our school spaces grow in tandem. Our goal, as always, is our commitment, our moral obligation to consider first what is best and necessary for each and every student. All students can learn and their achievement is greater in buildings that meet their academic needs. This is our collective commitment, nurturing the potential of each and every student and fostering a community where excellence thrives. Thank you for considering what is best for students 
what is best for our county's children, and what is best for the future of our neighborhoods, towns, and the county as a whole. We look forward to the discussion and to your questions. Uh, so now I'm going to turn things over uh, to my colleagues, uh, Mr. Seth Adams, Associate Superintendent of Facilities Management, and uh, Mr. Brian Hall, uh, Deputy Superintendent Operations. Uh, okay, I don't think you all have opening comments. You're just here for questions. So the last thing I'll say before turning it back to you, I'm sure there's colleagues with questions. Uh, tough decisions, but $211 million to help us fix schools. When I, you all have visited schools, there's a lot of things that need to be fixed. You hear about it a lot. I just want to emphasize that while some of this, some projects are pushed out, this will have a big impact on improving the daily lives of students and families uh, if we can stick to it. So. With that, Mr. President, that was a unanimous recommendation from the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you to the committee. Let's turn to colleagues for a discussion, starting with Council Vice President Stewart. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to our Education and Culture Committee, um, to our wonderful uh, central staff, um, and to uh, the chair of the uh, president of the Board of Education and um, interim superintendent and MCPS staff. Um, I know this was a lot of work. Um, I was able to join some of the committee sessions um, to, uh, you know, to hear the discussion and participate in that, and as well as chair of government operations and fiscal policy, um, figuring out how we do this, uh, you know, plan for our infrastructure in a sustainable way is top of mind um, for all of us. Um, I do want to just lift up, though, um, a letter that um, my colleagues, Council President Friedson and Council Member Meek and I sent regarding um, Woodward and the uh, future of that. You know, we realize the financial constraints of the current budget cycle and all the work that has been done and truly appreciate that and understand that some projects are being pushed out or delayed. However, having said that, the removal of the auditorium without communicating a clear plan to meet the needs of the students over multiple years is frustrating for our community members. Um, many of our Northwood High School students uh, who will be attending the school at Woodward High School, and I know Councilmember Mink and I share those families, um, will have faced construction in their schools for years. Um, students who have attended Silver Spring International Middle School, and I'm glad to see that is on the list and moving forward in construction, have been without an, oratori an auditorium for years. And um, Superintendent, as you, know, as you said, we need to focus on the children and the students. And I just ask us as we're looking at three or four year delays that we remember that's a high school time for a student and their family. And to be asked for students to live without the facilities that other students have in our county and without communicating clearly what those plans are cause a lot of anxiety. Um, and so our request is just um, to, uh, documentation of the support and approaches that MCPS will use to support full access of programming for the Northwood High School community during its time at Woodward High School. And we ask that we want assurances that we will find a way to address the delay in construction of the auditorium as we enter the next CIP amendment and review it in the fall. Again, fully appreciate the work that has been done by uh, Education and Culture Committee, understanding where we are now, but just making a plea, we need a plan communicated to our families and the community that, um, and to us, as well as planning for that auditorium when it opens. Thank you. I'll just piggyback off of that uh, briefly just to ask a question. Ha has a, a high school been built, a new high school been built in Montgomery County without an auditorium? No, and we intend not to build a high school without an auditorium. This is just a brief delay due to the fiscal shortages associated with these two schools. But I would add, though, at the onset of the decision to uh, locate Northwood High School at the Woodward facility, there was always going to be a time uh, where they would not be, be able to utilize an auditorium. So the planning of how to support the academics of, of the students of Northwood has, has always been there since day one. Uh, what we're talking about now is obviously extending that past a year into possibly two and three. Uh, so that's the, the work we will do to communicate how we support. But I would say the, the spaces 
at Woodward were designed specifically to support uh, the performing arts uh, program of Northwood. So we feel very confident that from that work with the early on um, design portion, that we'll be able to support these students and families, even though it is an extended delay or, or, or time period without an auditorium. I'll just reemphasize, I think it's really important. Auditorium is really the hub of where many of the community activities and events occur, not just performing arts. I mean, it is really at the, the center and the, the heart of a high school, which obviously learning needs to be the number one priority of a school, but schools do and are much more than that to the families and the communities that rely on them. And an auditorium really speaks to that. And you know, I'll just reiterate not only the letter uh, that I joined with uh, my two colleagues, but in 2019, I wrote a letter to Dr. Smith emphasizing the need for parity that we shouldn't be building certain high schools with certain amenities and other high schools with others, because this has been part of the conversation from the beginning about Woodward, of whether or not Woodward should receive the same type of high school amenities as every other high school has ever had and has ever been built with. And in 2022, I wrote a similar letter to Dr. McKnight about the concerns about delays related uh, to these projects. And I just think it's important to note these projects don't just impact one school community. This is not just, you know, supporting one school community. This, these projects were intended to support really the entire portion of the county, almost the entire county. You combine these with Crown and it's the, almost the entire student population and families of Montgomery County Public Schools. So the decisions that we make here are, are important. And, you know, when we talk about boundary changes when we talk about school facilities if we have different schools that have wildly different amenities that changes the ability for the school system to make thoughtful decisions on how to utilize assets to make sure that everybody's receiving a world-class education to make sure that everybody is going to school in a safe uh, environment and that it's it's a comfortable environment for those who work and, and go to school there. So appreciate uh, the, the work. I will uh, move uh, to our next colleague, uh, uh, Councilmember Lukey. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, and again, I, I want to echo appreciation for uh, the ENC committee. This is tough work. Um, and to Ms. McGuire and Mr. Levchenko, again, um, always tough work, but you're also very creative. And so my ask is going to be about creativity. Um, this is a difficult year, and we have to be very, very realistic about what we can afford. And to be fair, there are projects in my district that are bumped right? Um, Magruder High School gets removed out of this entire CIP. And I know that, that there are renovations that are urgently needed, but I also appreciate that that was not a project that was on the cusp of getting started. Two other high schools that serve my district, Paint Branch and James Hubert Blake, which my, three of my four kids attend, were also proposed to add new things, but aren't going to make the cut, right? And I get that. Again, they were not teed up and ready to go. Um, but Damascus High School is in a very different position. Um, and the, four, the proposed four-year construction delay for a facility that was constructed and opened 74 years ago and has not had a renovation for 46 years, when we had construction funds allocated in our current fiscal year as well as allocated already for FY25, that's hard. And that affects more than one school. As noted in the memorandum that Councilmember Balcom and I sent jointly, the overcrowding issues that are presenting challenges for both Damascus High School and Clarksburg High School affect both of our districts. Um, and I understand and appreciate the very lengthy discussion we had on the operational issue related to the auto tech program. And again, I want to thank my colleagues on ENC for, for digging into that and um, the industry representatives who were here for talking about the ongoing challenges and making sure we have these career tech programs at our schools. But I don't want us to get distracted by an operational issue in making capital budgeting decisions. They are two different things. They may seem interrelated in the way they are discussed, but really the focus needs to be on the capital issue. And um, 
knowing that this has been going on for as long as it has been going on and that we were on the cusp of starting those renovations after multiple community conversations up there. Um, and, and I totally respect what Dr. Felder said, that we need buildings that meet our st students' educational needs. And we're talking about a 74-year-old building. Um, so I would ask that the, that the committee or sorry, that the council um, keep this discussion going. That's what I'm asking for. Don't close the door. And that I'm asking that we treat Damascus High School um, as the chair had suggested for um, Eastern Middle School, right? To make it a high priority to see what we can do to avoid such a substantial delay in this particular arena. And again, I fully pledged to work with um, program leaders and with the school system to figure out how best to tackle the auto tech issue um, for the future. Um, so I just want to thank my colleagues and I want to uh, thank the council president and um, our staff and hope that we can work together to find a positive resolution that doesn't involve a four year delay. Thank you. Thank you, council member Katz. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, Mr. President. And I, too, want to join the chorus of, of thanking everyone for all of your hard work, including my colleagues on, on, the, uh, on the council. You know, as, as was noted earlier, we always have more needs than we have money. And that's not going to go away. I mean, even if we had all the money in the world, we'd find some extra needs. I mean, we, we always have this situation. And I do agree, as, as was mentioned, that we need to keep our discussions and our communications open for not just this topic, but for all topics, but especially this one. And I, and I want to thank uh, for the third district, and, and we talk about our, our county in various districts of your district council member, but one district affects all districts. And, 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 um, but for the third district, I do want to thank ab uh, about the uh, ENC committee, about the uh, discussions, <clears throat> excuse me, for uh, Twinbrook Elementary. Uh, I think that was very necessary and you're going to keep the planning on schedule, which is part of our planning. For Wooten High School, and I want to, there again, I think that, you know, if we had all the money in the world, if we had a, uh, a magic wand, we would do something in addition to what is being suggested for Wooten High School. But we heard from Mayor Ashton when she was here. We heard from students that talked about the ADA improvements that during, during a, I think it was a bomb scare, I don't know, it was, it was some, some uh, exciting uh, moments there, that other students had to help carry some students out of that building because of the entranceway that they were near. And they did, and, and our students stepped up and we thanked them, but that should never happen. We, I mean, we should have all of that uh, working together. And, and I believe because you're keeping the, the uh, ADA improvements on schedule, that that would be a, the right thing. But in all fairness, we need to make certain that the ADA improvements don't necessarily have to wait. If there's something wrong, we need to be fixing those along the way. And I'm, and as I said earlier, Woodward High School uh, is not in my district, but it is in our district. And 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 there's certainly been schools, I guess, along the way that that we were at Woodward over the years in, in Northwood to to uh, to be affected. And I believe that we should certainly keep one one target the the auditoriums. And then let's get to Crown. You know, Crown, I don't know how many people remember, but when Crown was annexed in, uh, I just looked it up because I didn't remember the year, but when Crown was annexed into the city of Gaithersburg in 2006, 2006, it was the first time in the history of Montgomery County that the city of Gaithersburg, I happen to know a few folks who were there at that time, that the city of Gaithersburg got a free, underline the word free, and it might be, the, I know it was the first time, it might be the only time that you got free 32 plus acres for a high school site. And, and it's now that 18 years, I believe we held up, I don't know, have you gotten the land yet from the city? And, and that was the reason. And, and I was a part of that. I'll, I'll say it very publicly. But that was a part of that because we knew that our good friends from Montgomery County Public Schools, and they are our good friends from Montgomery County Public Schools, that we need to hold your feet to the fire on every now and then to get things done. 
and to to get free 32 acres and you'll they'll give it to you i mean there's no they're i mean they could use it for a park i'm not saying that they couldn't use the land but they'll eventually give it to you but the fact is that if you've gotten something for free we should also make certain that we use that credit that we use that 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 uh, that, uh, that those dollars that you didn't have to pay for land and i would assume that the land if you bought it today would be $40 million, I mean, who knows what the figure is. But the, the bottom line on this is we need to continue to be, and I want to under, underline the word continue, to be partners on this so that no child, regardless of where they are, that no child has a, and, and I, I don't want to use the term substandard, but I'm using it, that they go to a substandard school, that they don't have something that some school down county would have or in other places would have, we, may need, we need to make certain that every school is built to the standard that we would be as proud of regardless of where it is. So I, I, I know that on, in Crown's part, and it's, it's out for bid, and, 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 and I'm sure that you'll make a deal with their, with their good friends from the city of Gaithersburg. I know that they want to make a deal with you. But the reality is that you need to treat everybody fairly when you're building those schools. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilmember Glass. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, thank you, MCPS, MCPS leadership and uh, Ms. McGuire and Mr. Lovchenko for, for your work. And of course, to the ENC committee uh, for engaging in this uh, difficult exercise. Um, we'll have another difficult exercise in a week or two when the T&E committee has its report out, the two biggest items within the CIP, uh, but very much uh, appreciate the work that, that you all did. Um, Want to uh, echo the sentiments of my colleagues, particularly with regard to the Woodward-Northwood situation. Um, I live in the Northwood cluster. Uh, and parents are concerned not only about the auditorium or lack thereof uh, at Woodward, but I think the bigger concern is the uncertainty with regard to the commute that the students likely, in all likelihood uh, right now, um, a high school student might never step foot in Northwood uh, if that is their home school uh, for high school. Um, and so Mr. Adams, I'll direct the question at you. When we uh, build a new school, tear down a new school, and relocate students, um, have there been, to you, the best of your knowledge or anyone else, um, have there been situations where students have traveled as far as Northwood to Woodward, which just Googling around nine miles or so? Now, I recognize some, some cluster. OK, well, I, I think it, some, some people are not aware. And it's important to provide the perspective as to how these things happen. That's why I asked the open-ended question. Sure, and that is a great question, and one that I think any time we talk about uh, a swing space school like this, it, it, it presents opportunities because it, it reduces impacts on students during the construction itself, but it presents other challenges such as access. So um, for a, a project like this, a, a school like Northwood, you know, we have a robust uh, experience really just navigating from the transportation, not only, you know, working to develop the best, you know, possible uh, routes to, to schools by having sweeper buses, having community stops for students to, to be able to attend. We've been working quite a bit with DOT just around stops because we know uh, a route from the neighbor, the Northwood community to Woodward. Right now, I think it's three or four stops they would they would need. So we're really working with them around are there um, direct routes that they could create um, for families, not just talking about students. Um, then even from the, the extracurricular side of things, the after school activities, uh, a robust experience not only with, with transportation but really partnering with neighboring schools. You know, while this, the, the auditorium piece is, is new from a fine performing arts, this has been standard practice on athletics for, for years. And I would say a Wheaton High School went five years without um, home access. So partnering with, with other schools, making sure they're welcomed into these schools, that the amenities are minim you know, the impacts to these amenities are minimized. So I do, I do think we have a, a robust, positive track record. I think it's really just that communication piece, making sure everyone knows 
every child, you know, where they need to be, what time, you know, what are the opportunities if they're late for that, that bus stop and, and so forth. So we're going to continue to work on that between now and obviously this summer um, when we start to transition Northwood over to the Woodward facility. I appreciate elaborating elaborating on that and uh, obviously um, over communicating is the best way to move forward there is anxiety and so uh, appreciate you uh, expanding on that um, and the last thing I'll just note um, you know uh, councilmember Lukey mentioned creativity and and I believe that was with respect to the budget uh, and trying to figure out how to make the most uh, with with what we have uh, I'll add another level of creativity that we continue uh, that we need uh, and it is in our infrastructure and design um, we spent a lot of time here on the council talking about land use and how to maximize our uh, ability to to build and innovate with uh, uh, ever diminishing land and you know uh, councilmember katz was talking about crown which uh, is the opposite uh, a nice parcel of land that conforms to mcps's current standards um, as we continue to uh, welcome people into montgomery county as we continue to grow um, parcels like that are unlikely to be available and so i think we need to to innovate uh, look at different types of school models uh, and the policies that we've had for the last number of decades with regard to acreage and other types of uh, requirements uh, i think we're being forced to rethink that um, while also providing high quality uh, uh, educational and recreational activities for our students. So just wanted to put a pin on that uh, as we continue working on land use policies here at the council. So thank you very much. Thank you, Councilmember Mink. Thank you. Uh, I want to echo much of what has been said by, by my colleagues. Um, obviously, we're working within a very tight budget and, um, you know, respect the difficulty there, but that makes the communication with families even more important. Um, and so, you know, with, with Northwood, as has been, as has been said, certainly under, understand that the auditorium and a delay there um, was a possibility. But as uh, Vice President Stewart noted, the difference between four years and one year uh, to a high school student is an eternity. That's the, that's the whole difference there. And given that there are students who are selecting Northwood because they want to study performing arts there and, and take advantage of the opportunities to lose their, their entire uh, uh, opportunity to be doing that within the space of an auditorium and not understanding uh, the pieces that MCPS is putting in place uh, is, is I certainly understand the heartbreak that we are hearing really from the, the wide community here. So the sooner you all can put out clear information about how students will be served there and be able to take part in the, in the rigorous and expansive performing arts programming that they are hoping to take advantage of, um, as well as taking into account uh, community needs to the extent possible, as noted by President Friedson, that would really be helpful um, for us in answering our, que our constituents' questions and also obviously the importance of them hearing directly from you uh, that you thought about that before making this decision. Um, I think you mentioned a black box theater. Would you be able to just take a quick 30 seconds here and just speak a little bit about some of what the specifics of what how you how you all are taking into account the, the needs sure that's that is a great question so we we've um, specifically designed the woodward facility for for one larger black box which which could handle you know a small performance but obviously the the normal practices are secondary performance spaces dance studios um you know other other um, multi-use types of facilities. And then the other piece too is we designed the cafeteria to be more of an assembly type of space to also double as possibly a performance space. So, um, you know, hearing the council loud and clear over, over we need to do differently, we need to approach these buildings differently. We absolutely have looked at this building very differently and, and we do feel there's gonna be more than ample spaces for not only the the day-to-day -day performing arts, uh, but smaller scale performances. It's just those larger performances where you may need to fit 400 plus people. The black box, we feel confident we can fit, you know, 100 to 150 families to participate in those. It's just those large performances that we'll continue to work through. And one thing I would just say, and I'll, and I'll go back, and actually the Wheaton project did remind me, there, there have been projects where they've taken time, you know, over the years to construct. Wheaton is a perfect example where the auditorium was the last piece of that multi-year project that was, was constructed. So this, while it is unprecedented for us to 
pause on the, the, the build as an overall building. We do have experience navigating um, you know, this type of, of challenge with, with our students. Not ideal, but certainly we, we have experience and we're certainly you know, ready to communicate and, and work through this with our families. But I, I do be, believe we're gonna have ample spaces at Woodward during their stay just those large performances, we'll have to get a little more creative and, and partner with neighboring schools or schools that are located closer to the Northwood community. Great, thank you. Well, I um, appreciate that and we'll look forward to uh, uh, seeing more of the communications that you'll put out to the community and then hopefully helping to amplify those communications as well. Um, other question is on the programming as we've talked about at Damascus High School, of course. Um, uh, my understanding, having spoken to some of our auto industry partners, um, is that it's not possible to have an auto program that meets national certification standards without some of the infrastructure like lifts. I understand that there are lifts at Seneca Valley, but there are fewer lifts there than there are at Damascus. And now we're talking about serving two school communities uh, instead of just one there. Um, Damascus has about depending on what time of year you're we're looking at around 60 students in their auto program right now i understand they have more than 80 signed up for next year so it's a very popular program that's growing and we're talking about dramatically shrinking potentially the number of lifts that they have access to so i'm just going to reiterate the committee's hope um, that you all will talk to industry about making sure that the damascus build out uh, takes into account the ability to at least maintain, if not expand, automotive certification programs akin to what we have now. And looking at some of the creative options that uh, could potentially be on the table, such as um, the uh, auto shop, which is up for sale <clears throat> within you know, a, a couple minutes drive or even a you know 15 minute walk or so from the school. Um, again, there is interest from multiple industry partners in exploring the possibility of a public pri private partnership there. That property is up for sale for about $4 million, which is a lot less than the $12 million. And so if there was interest in exploring a possibility in which MCPS purchased the property and, uh, and private partners uh, upgraded and, and maintained it and served students there, I leave it to you to, to talk about the details and whether that's actually plausible, but just to put out there that there are some uh, creative options that could be looked at. And uh, the committee, I know, looks forward to hearing back from you all about the conversations that you all will hopefully have directly with our industry partners within the foundation there. And, um, and certainly I would also like to ask for uh, communications from our industry partners directly from the foundation to have those that are next, to have their voices present again at the next conversation I think will also be important and hopefully we can have a robust conversation that I, I assume will extend over you know, the many months and, and year and so on to come. But I want to make sure that the community knows that we are hard at work to make sure that, again, that national standards are going to be met here and kids are going to have a chance to be hands on uh, in a way that uh, it, the industry says, yes, these are the kids that we can employ and that we can move up. And, and I want to make sure everybody knows also that these are not solely career track, that these are also college track positions. There's a whole range um, of, uh, of different ca uh, careers and jobs that kids are, are able to move into. Uh, would you all like to speak to that program as well and serving them or those conversations? Well, well, certainly. I think you know we've obviously heard loud and clear from the, the families that, that could be impacted. Um, you know, again, I, I, I would say this is a, uh, an approach to think differently about our buildings. You know, again, echoing, you know, what we've heard from council, um, to think about how do we evolve, you know, our career and, and technology programs. And, you know, again, I'll, I'll go back to our uh, committee discussions around Seneca Valley and the construction trades. It looks very different than what the model that we're used to. Um, we're finding great success with that. So I, I do think this is a case where we'll just, we, we need to continue that dialogue. We need to build this out together. Um, it, if it ultimately means adding more to the Damascus project, I, I do believe we have time to do that. Um, but it also, I think we have to recognize that we did construct Seneca Valley for the purposes of creating a hub and then also really just to have real conversations about what that means. If that's not a model that can be supported or that's not a model that makes sense for, for all students and families, then certainly we, we need to have more discussions around what the implications of, of sort of transitioning off from a, from an up county hub would look like. But yes, we're, we're well prepared to talk and we are actually very prepared to talk about different innovative approaches 
public-private partnerships, not only for this type of program, but also even the auditorium work that we're talking about at Crown and, and Woodward. So uh, we're, we're ready to, to think differently and, and approach these issues uh, from a different lens than what historically we've done in the past. Okay, I appreciate it and uh, look forward to hearing back about the conversations that you've had again directly with our foundation's industry partners in this regard this month um, and then and we'll be looking forward to hearing from them as well about that. And, um, it, you know, I think that the, the Upcounty Hub, there's a lot that makes sense about the Hub model, certainly, and I understand and appreciate that you all are thinking creatively and, and innovatively, um, but I want to we can't innovate in an industry field without industry being at the forefront of those conversations. They have not been in, included uh, to the extent necessary, I think, to, to make sure that we are, again, meeting those certification standards, and so appreciate that you all are embarking on that. Now, um, and then also wanted to just get clarity on the hospitality program. I understand that you weren't able to get an instructor for that in time um, at, at Damascus. Is that right? Uh, restaurant management. I'm sorry, restaurant management, sorry. Um, restaurant management at the start of the year. Uh, is that something that has been remedied over the course of this year? Are we teed up for next year to bring that back or what is the plan? Uh, I, I know the school is, is actively always looking for- And appreciate for the indulgence for, I know we're kind of embarked. Uh, for, so for moving a little to the yeah. side here, but want to make sure we get this on the record. Thanks. Yep, yeah, we're, we're actively always looking for instructors for those unique programs. I think that was a program that, that did have uh, strong participation in the past, and without an instructor, it was not a program that we, we could implement this year. But uh, you know, certainly as the school goes through their staffing models and staffing plans, it's space that that, that building has. So certainly I know um, in talking with the principal and team, that's certainly a position they will continue to seek after and certainly from the support of central office and our HR department to figure out if there's a way to staff that. Okay, great. Yeah, and the space question is why this is tangentially relevant to the conversation we're having now. Of course, I think the community wants to make sure that that space is gonna be accounted for in future builds. And if we're scaling back the program now, that's an indication that it's not. But i um, gl glad to hear that you're looking for the instructor and um, would certainly urge you to talk to, again, our foundation's industry partners in that space as well. Uh, they are in touch with graduates from that program who might be a good fit. Uh, so, you know, they're a good place to look if you're looking for an instructor there. Thank you. I yield. Thank you. Next is Council Member Balcom. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's always interesting. Uh, you have uh, certain things you're going to say and then and then you <laughs> add on as people go along. I, I do want to just highlight and thank uh, Council Member Mink for her leadership in this Damascus uh, issue from a perspective of workforce development. Um, we, we need those industry partners, uh, not only during the programming phase, but during the construction phase. And so I, I think that's important. We, we, from a workforce development perspective, we are begging industry to get involved. And here we have these fa uh, foundation partners who are asking and are giving, uh, giving their, not only their advice, but their, the standards, the national standards. And so I think that we just need to be more, um, uh, in, involved and engaged in what they're doing. I, I appreciate the the hub model and I appreciate the the innovative look at space. However, we have a we have a program in place that meets national standards, and um, I think that we're going backwards by by taking it away. So I just I just wanted to lift that up as well. Uh, and a, and a, I should have started by thanking the committee, um, the, the uh, Chair Juwando and members of the committee. This is a really difficult discussion, uh, but it's it's just frustrating to have a, a program that, that we may lose. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. Um, and then I also, from the perspective of Northwood uh, and multi-year construction projects, um, I think that Construction is just stressful for not only for the students, but of course the parents, but the, but the um, the employees, the principal, the teachers, the staff, and it's a stressful situation having just lived it through with the Poolsville construction. And you mentioned we all mentioned communication. Communication is important, and communication certainly with the students and the parents. Uh, but I would I would. Um, implore you to to communicate with the district council uh, representatives. We get these 
calls every day, as you know, with our um, situation with Poolsville, we get the calls every day. And so it's just so important that we have a full up-to-date understanding of what's happening with a construction project as it goes along. Um, so um, those are just the comments that I added on. What I wanted to say, first of all, was thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, Poolsville has our clap in tomorrow morning. I don't know if, how, what the rain's gonna do um, with that, but um, we really appreciate uh, the, the diligent work that, that you all have done on Poolsville and also Nielsville. Uh, every time I'm on the corner and I see this shining new building on the hill, uh, I appreciate that, um, so thank you. Uh, and then from Councilmember Katz's perspective of um, every school is in our district, right? So when uh, when I look at my district, uh, I've got Crown on, on you know one side and Damascus on the other side. Both of those projects will have significant impact on District 2 um, with the reboundary, whatever the boundary, what, whatever boundary decisions are going to be made with Crown, that's such a big, um, boundary discussion uh, and will have impact on Northwest and then maybe Seneca Valley and then you come from the Damascus perspective um, and what happens with Clarksburg um, and so it's just really important that uh, when we think about these these schools it's it really is they uh, just they're they're all moving pieces um, and so you know, I, I'm very happy that Crown's going forward, and I really hope that we can keep the discussion open with Damascus. I, I um, share that boundary with Councilmember Lutke and appreciate her efforts on that too. So, um, so thank you. Councilmember Fani Gonzalez. Good morning. Uh, thank you for coming today. Two very brief comments, uh, very similar to what my colleague Councilmember Balcom mentioned. Um, Twinbrook Elementary School and Northwood High School, they're not on my district, but right next to it, like literally like next to it. So most of, significant number of my families in my district go to those particular schools. Um, my my kids' home school is actually Northwood High School. So I do get some notifications about the construction as a parent, but it's really not enough. So again, reemphasizing the need of, of making sure that we're communicating more. Um, I cannot help myself, but when you mentioned the black box, it touched a nerve on me just because um, Mary Lillerman Middle School in Aspen Hill has a black box. I was on the planning board and I worked on it uh, for the mandatory approval. And I went to that school about a year ago and um, it was sad to see that many of the kids that talked to me during that event that I held in that school told me, we have a beautiful space, but we don't have a technical staff to actually manage the black box that we built. So yes, it's great to have these things, but if we don't have the staff to, to actually make the magic happen, then it's, it's meaningless. And it's, so this, this position is so frustrating because Again, I'm sorry to say it, we give you guys the money trusting that you're gonna hire the staff to do certain things and yet you hire certain consultants to do things that have nothing to do with instruction. And that has to stop. So yes, we're gonna have a beautiful black box in Northwood High School where my kids are gonna go to, yet I bet you that we're not, have, we're not gonna have the staff to actually work on it. And um, so see why I'm frustrated here. Um, Yes, so communication and really falling through things and just limit excuses. That's what I'm asking. And I'm saying that more as a parent than as a council member. I can see that. That's it, thank you. If I may, just we hear you about the uh, staffing for the black box for Loiterman. Um, the board did reinstate a position for Loiterman in our budget adjustments that we did after the superintendent presented her budget, we made some adjustments and the staff person for Loiterman was reinstated uh, for uh, based on the board's recommendation. So we hope that when all comes, when all is settled, when the budget is settled, we are still able to um, operationalize that board priority. Thank you. Uh, I'll just note, I'm. Uh, 
Sorry, I won't be at the clap-in uh, at Poolsville. I will say, obviously, was very uh, involved uh, in that. I used to be the recipient of the phone calls, as noted, uh, but uh, very uh, appreciative of the, the work. Uh, and uh, it has been an interesting dynamic of transitioning from the last council to this council, uh, having you know represented some of these key projects, uh, and some of which are moving forward and everyone's very excited about, and some of which, um, have left uh, some uh, room for improvement, better communication, and, and continued concern about making sure that there's parity, uh, you know, among the projects, which has been a theme really for all of the projects to ensure that every family has access to a great school and a great facility that reflects the the, the quality of the instruction and programming that goes alongside uh, and inside of it. Um, I just uh, had a quick final question uh, here. Uh, the uh, Walter Johnson BCC uh, study, uh, you know, and, and uh, budget being moved. Could you just go into uh, an explanation of that calculation? I know, you know, as you know, was discussed in the committee, was determined based on capacity decisions, uh, you know, and, and, and need. But could you just explain that? If I, if I could just, real quickly, I do want to comment that, that that particular shift was not put forward by the school system. That was a shift that came out of the committee's discussion. Um, so certainly Mr. Adams may uh, want to speak to the specifics of that project, but I just wanted to clarify that that did not originate with the school system. <clears throat> it was um, our analysis through, again, the discussion of the capacity in that um, in those clusters uh, and the discussion with the committee that the planning funds for that given the relative availability of capacity in those clusters that those planning funds could be shifted later into the CIP and I will just say too that certainly there was discussion at the committee about maintaining um, engagement with the community and what level of funding will need to remain in 25 to maintain um, that part of the process as the future planning goes forward appreciate that i'll turn to the committee if necessary but i'd love to hear from the school system just on what the impact of that will be and what the uh, capacity uh, challenges may be as a result of that change sure so i i i would say that when that project first started you know we had many of our walter johnson elementary school uh, schools over over utilized as well as bethesda elementary uh, following, you know, over the course of the several years, you know, we, we implemented that boundary change down in Bethesda, which included Bethesda, um, Somerset, and Westbrook. That relieved a little of the pressure off of, of Bethesda. And then the Walter Johnson cluster, we've seen some, some enrollment overutilization decline over the past several years. So uh, as Ms. McGuire did mention, um, you know, we do not think at this point, based on the numbers, that it would necessitate, necessitate a brand new school, uh, but we wanted to leave the room in that project to be able to go out into those communities and have a discussion around what the next steps or implications around that would be. Um, Ashburton, you know, again, that has the modular building that is not counted as part of capacity, but they do have an enclosed separate building. Bethesda, we're seeing, you know, some uh, you know, growth still, uh, but, but certainly not to the level it was prior to the boundary change. So uh, for us, it's going to be important to go out to those communities, engage, just talk about, you know, what, what are the implications to those two particular schools, and then to see, um, you know, really what, what the next steps could be. But based on the numbers, a brand new school just, just doesn't make sense. So, you know, discussions around those planning dollars, around what to do, we, but we felt it was important. Again, in, in, in the, in the uh, conversation of tra transparency and conversation and community engagement to make sure we go out and have that conversation this fall uh, to, to, to do the latest and greatest updates. Well, one of my kindergarten age nieces was one of the Bethesda Elementary School moved to Somerset uh, students. So I can uh, you know attest to that and, and have been impacted uh, by that within uh, my own uh, family and, and community. Um, well, I appreciate that. I think just highlighting the prior point of engaging with the district council members. If you could keep monitoring that, obviously I understand why that decision has been made, but it's an ongoing issue, um, you know, particularly at some of the schools more than others where uh, mid-year uh, changes to student population are more acute than others, depending on where you are in the county. They're, you know, with, uh, you know, different types of jobs and different types of, of changes, uh, the student population can, change more frequently than, you know, once in August, uh, you know, just different uh, depending on where you are. And there are certain 
uh, elementary schools in that in those two clusters in particular that are very much uh, impacted uh, by, by that. So uh, if you could continue to keep us uh, in the loop, my office specifically, but all the offices uh, impacted, um, you know, I think that would uh, that would be uh, helpful. And I'll just say uh, in, in closing here, first of all, thank you to Chair Juando. Thank you to the entire uh, Education and Culture Committee for recognizing the importance of systemics. Uh, this is something that we have been talking about for a while. It's not easy to do. Thank you to staff and to the school system for your active participation and, and collaboration. Nobody wants to make uh, these decisions, but we do have to get serious and, and honest about what the long-term needs are going to be so that we're not setting unrealistic expectations and then continuously falling short of those expectations. I think we all lose in that scenario and, and most of whom are the families and the students and the teachers who are banking on something happening and then uh, it doesn't happen and frankly it was never going to happen because we didn't put ourselves in a position to, to make it happen. So I think you know, being more more honest on the front end, more transparent on the front end, uh, makes a lot more sense uh, on the end. And I will say, as somebody who was in Montgomery County Public Schools, I think I was one of the first elementary school students uh, in a portable uh, in Montgomery County Public Schools. They didn't have them in portables at first, uh, or uh, portables in, in elementary schools, from what I understand. Uh, there's a Potomac Almanac story where I was quoted about being one of those <laughs> students. It was my debut in public, uh, you know, uh, uh, in the public light, uh, I, I guess, as a 10-year-old. Um, and as somebody who was in a high school that was being renovated while I was there. And, you know, there, there are no wins to these questions. Would you rather have a long commute and be disrupted in that way, disrupting your 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 daily life, that your family's life, the the impact that it has on on students and you know extracurricular activities and homework and everything else, or would you rather have the disruption of an active construction site next to where you're trying to learn and teach and go about the the, the, the daily activities of a school? It's neither nor. <laughs> I don't think anybody wants either of those. They want a new, beautiful, quality school to go into that has been constructed. Uh, so I, you know, do appreciate the challenge uh, that you know, there really aren't easy answers to a lot of these questions, particularly then when you add on the constraints uh, as well. So thank you uh, to to everybody, uh, Dr. Felder. Do you have something to add? Yes, indeed. Uh, well, first and foremost, I wanted to just share that. Um, Portables are sometimes now referred to as learning cottages. <laughs> so I just wanted to share that, but also wanted to say thank you uh, for this opportunity to engage. Um, I'm leaving here uh, knowing that we're all on the same page and wanting to do what's best for our children. And um, I've got pages full of notes, so thank you for all of your feedback. But one of the things, uh, reoccurring things I heard, and one of the things we've been talking about as staff, is that we have to do a better job of uh, communicating, communicating with all stakeholders, including everyone in this room. So uh, we take that back, and we will do better in that regard. So thank you. Learning Cottages. Okay, I think uh, <laughs> somewhere there's an Orwell book that... Uh, uh, yeah. They look better inside than outside. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Uh, yeah, I think George Orwell would be would be jealous of that of that terminology. But uh, point taken, and I might use that term in the future. I'm not sure. Uh, I, I I will, but I appreciate the the the, the point. I think that that we we know that there are there's tremendous learning that is happening. There's a lot of hard work that is happening, and we want to make sure that there are facilities that reflect the learning that's happening inside of it, the quality of the students and the teachers and the staff uh, that are there. I know that's a shared commitment. Appreciate everybody's work uh, to move that forward. So uh, with that, there were no motions to make any changes to the committee. Recommend, oh, uh, the, oh, you, you had, a, I didn't hear a second though. Oh, sorry. sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was moving to have. Council Member Lukey had a motion. I just want to give an opportunity. Why don't you restate your motion? We'll see if there's a second. Sorry about that. My motion was to have Damascus High School project treated as a high priority, uh, similar to the way Eastern Middle School is being treated under the committee's recommendation to see if there is some way to um, modify the four-year delay. I don't see a second. For, there's a second by Councilmember Balcom. Are there any comments? Council, Councilmember Jawanda? Chair Jawanda. I, I appreciate the robust discussion and, and the uh, 
recommendation and, and the advocacy of Councilmember Lukey and others. And we also, we did talk about, again, not wanting to have to tell people that we're gonna do something that we can't do. Um, in the high school projects, just to give the public context, these are $200 million plus projects. We saved 211 million to put in the systemics. Um, I, I don't, you know, there are, we have the dream team here, but the magic that would need to be done to put Damascus High School to move it back up, um, I think would eliminate the strategy that we're trying to accomplish. And so I, I for that reason, I, I can't, I can't, so I have to support our committee recommendation and I'm the chair, I have to support our committee <laughs> recommendation. But uh, I understand the desire and certainly uh, there are always off year amendments um, and there's obviously another full CIP again in two years. Uh, if there's more, if we, if the economy changes, if some, you know, maybe construction costs go down, you know, I, I, there's a lot of things we would hope would happen. It could always be re revisited, but I think it would be very difficult. And I would hesitate to s set that expectation uh, given the cost of the project. Appreciate that. Uh, Councilmember Luke. Um, so this is a question for Ms. McGuire and Mr. Levchenko. The money that was allocated in FY24, the capital funds allocated to the Damascus project in FY24, um, have not been spent. Is that correct? I'm going to defer to the school system on that question. So the planning dollars are being spent. Um, I don't believe construction dollars began until 25. But, but yes, yeah, so we are expending the planning dollars currently. Okay, because um, one, and I know we'll talk about this later this week at, at, at the GO Committee, um, with a, not with respect to MCPS, but with the, respect to the Office of Legislative Oversights, where I had asked for a study regarding the amount of funds that we spend on planning and design for things that don't get built or are so delayed in build that the economics of it are all out of whack, right? And um, that is, again, why I was advocating for this, particularly where the planning and design dollars have been spent, construction dollars haven't been spent, but they are on the cusp of and were already allocated for FY25, which was to start in a few months. So um, that is why I was asking about that, because again, we've already expended taxpayer funds on the planning and design and teed this up. and. As I think as the universe has taught us, delays don't make things cost less money. So um, appreciate everyone's thoughts and considerations. Okay, are we ready to vote on the uh, recommendation? On the amendment, excuse me, on the amendment, all those in favor of the amendment to advance Damascus High School uh, as a high priority, please raise your hand. Okay, all those opposed? Okay, I think there's uh, sympathetic views uh, for all of these projects, but a, an appreciation to the committee for the work that they did and an interest in moving forward with the committee recommendation, given all of the challenges and constraints uh, within the confines of the capital budget. Uh, with that, we have a committee recommendation before us. All those in favor of the committee recommendation, please raise your hand. That is unanimous among all those present, 10 to nothing. And so thank you to Montgomery County Public Schools, to the superintendent, the board, and to staff for all of your hard work uh, in coordinating with the committee and, and with colleagues uh, to move that forward. So thank you. Okay, thank you. We're moving on uh, to item two, uh, which is our call a bill for final reading. I see Ms. McCartney-Green has joined us. Uh, this is uh, Bill 324, Late Night Establishments, Hours of Operation. The Joint Public Safety and Economic Development Committees recommend approval with amendments. Chair Katz, would you like to share the Joint Committee's recommendation. I would thank you very much and I see that Councilmember Albernaz's name is uh, is before us. I don't know we've seen him yet but hopefully he's doing fine. Um, yes the joint committee the uh, uh, public safety as well as the uh, economic development committee met and it was a it's a seven group committee because of the 
Uh, it was a six to one vote. Council Member Sales opposed it. And this is for the joint committee. We had many uh, visitors as well. Uh, Vice President Stewart was there. Council Member Albernaz was there. And Council Member Glass was there. He's a part of the joint committee, but was also part of the of the uh, original uh, peop the people that that uh, endorsed this. Um, the 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 committee itself, this bill, um, uh, certainly caused much discussion. We we went through what we needed to do. We we learned uh, again that uh, various jurisdictions are doing things differently with Hukka Hukka bars. Prince George's County is now saying that they have to close at eight o'clock. Baltimore County is saying that they have to close at midnight. Uh, Washington, D.C. says it's the same time as bars and restaurants. And in Montgomery County, we had no, no uh, 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 time frame that said when, when a hookah bar had to close. The committee, uh, there again, it was a six to one vote, but the committee uh, said specifically that we would um, um, pass this and that it would be an expedited bill so that it would go into effect uh, immediately upon, upon the approval and the signature of the county executive. Uh, I do know that Ms. Uh, 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 Ludine Green uh, uh, is here and, and uh, um, Ms. McCarthy, McCartney Green is here. As, and I do believe that perhaps what we should have a discussion, Mr. President, if it meets with your approval, with Vice President Stewart, who was the the uh, author of, of the beginning of this. Sure. Uh, well, I would suggest, uh, let me see if the Joint Committee Chair has anything to add from that. So uh, nothing from her. I can turn to the sponsors, then we'll turn it to colleagues who are in the queue, um, uh, um, unless there's any additional comments from Ms. McCartney-Green or from Dr. Stoddard. Okay, so why don't we, uh, we'll turn to uh, sponsors uh, first, then we'll turn to colleagues uh, in the queue, uh, starting with uh, Council Vice President Stewart. Great, thank you. I just want to um, thank both the, uh, the two committees who reviewed this. Thank you to Chair Katz and uh, Chair Fanny Gonzalez for their work on this, um, and my uh, two colleagues, Council Member Glass and Albernaz, for co-sponsoring this. Um, this bill uh, we've worked on for more than a year. During that time, we've convened multiple meetings, um, sometimes weekly, uh, to discuss concerns and challenges in our downtown Silver Spring area related to um, calls for service, crime, noise, other activities that are taking place um, overnight. Um, who did we meet with? Owners of our late night establishments, owners of businesses adjacent um, to this area and these businesses, the um, Ethiopian American Chamber of Commerce, the Ethiopian Community Center, individual residents, condo associations, pretty much every neighborhood group um, adjacent to the area, as well as our police department, our Silver Spring Citizen Advisory Board, and our Silver Spring Chamber of Commerce, as well as the owners of um, the hookah lounges. I do want to thank um, Dr. Stoddard um, for his work on this, being at many of those meetings, as well as Jacob Newman, the Regional Services Director for Silver Spring um, who did a great deal of work on this as well. Um, really our goal here is to bring parity for our late night businesses. Um, what this bill does is it creates a closing time at 2 a.m. during the week and 3 a.m. for all of our um, late night businesses um, and as Chair Katz mentioned our neighboring jurisdictions have been moving into this area. Baltimore closes at midnight, Prince George's at 8 p.m. And in fact, Prince George's went a bit further and actually said hookah lounges could only be in light industrial areas and need to close at 8 p.m. And the District of Columbia closes um, their businesses, their hookah lounges, as well as those who serve alcohol at uh, the same time. As we've discussed during uh, the committee sessions, staying open overnight has negatively impacted other businesses in close proximity and our overall downtown Silver Spring area. Um, and as nothing else in the region is open late at night and have been experiencing closing times, 
Silver Spring is becoming the after party spot. Um, and this is having negative impacts on our residents or other businesses and increasing the cost of public safety. Um, and we know the Public Safety Committee and many of us have had conversations regarding our shortage of police officers um, and that there is a need here to concentrate officers in this area around Bonifant where a majority of the lounges are located. And this has actually impacted response times um, for other places. Um, police in District 3, um, that runs from the DC line in Silver Spring to Burtonsville. And while the majority of our officers um, have to be in downtown Silver Spring overnight into the early morning hours, um, this does lead to longer response times in other places in the district. Um, in addition to these public safety concerns, I also want to lift up the well-documented public health concerns related to HUCA. I want to thank uh, Ms. McCartney Green for the excellent packet and her work on this. Um, it was noted in the packet, and I just want to lift up that the CDC quantifies that one hour of smoking hookah is the equivalent of smoking 100 to 200 times the amount of smoke someone would inhale from a single cigarette. In a single water pipe session, users are exposed to up to nine times the carbon monoxide and 1.7 times the nicotine of a single cigarette. This is documented in Ms. McCartney Green's packet. Um, in addition to this, um, the, in the ResJ statement um, that we received on this, it was also highlighted concerns about the public health implications for folks who worked at um, these lounges. So while we are concerned about the public safety challenges, and I think our conversation has been focused on that, I wanted to make sure today as we were taking up our final vote on this bill that we did not lose sight of these public health concerns. And in addition, across the world, people are focusing even much more than we are here in the United States on these public health concerns. They were addressed by the Ethiopian parliament that passed legislation in 2019 and had one of Africa's strongest anti-tobacco laws to address the health implications of tobacco and hookah. And right now the Ethiopian law bans the sale of heated tobacco products, e-cigarettes, and hookah. In addition, hookah is banned in African countries including Cameroon, Kenya, Tanzania, Rwanda, Mali, and Ghana. And the World Health Organization is working to shut down the availability of hookah in many countries because of the extremely concerning data related to cancer and because hookah is being marketed to young adults. During the work session, we did not engage our new Division Chief for Public Health Service, Dr. Nina Ashford, um, but I know she had been ready to speak to us today and I'm sure can follow up uh, with members who may have uh, additional questions. I understand that this, will, this bill does impact um, a handful of our lounges, um, but I do feel that we cannot ignore the public health and the public safety needs of our residents who are living here and for the workers who work in these lounges. You know, when we look at our downtown areas, there is a big difference from promoting a nighttime economy that is safe for people who visit here and who live here and promoting a 24-hour um, area and promoting something that is not in the public's health um, concerns. Um, with this bill, we still allow our, these businesses to be open into the night and early morning. Um, and I believe that having this parity um, is the best way to move forward, understanding there will be an impact on them, um, but really hearing from other businesses and our community that action needs to be taken. Again, I want to thank our um, McCole Leeds, Council Member Albanaz, and Glass, as well as my colleagues who have co-sponsored this bill, and to all the work that has been put into it. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President Stewart. Let me turn it over to uh, one of the other two co-lead sponsors, Council Member Glass. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I also want to extend my appreciation to Vice President Stewart and Council Member Albanaz uh, for uh, partnering on this effort uh, as Council Member Stewart uh, noted uh, she has been working on this essentially since she was elected uh, and Councilmember Albernaz and I have been working on this before then uh, signaling how much of a need there is for this not only among the business community but among the residents and among those who visit and enjoy our nightlife establishments this is about safety 
and it is also about fairness. We want our patrons and visitors to enjoy themselves in a safe way, and we want our residents to be safe. From 2022 to 2023, there was a 53% increase in calls regarding disorderly conduct between the hours of 2 and 3 a.m. That is a strain on the residents who live down there. It is a strain on the businesses, and most importantly, it's a strain on our public safety officials who could be doing other things in other areas. And with regard to fairness, we already have closing hours for nearly every other business, especially those in the nightlife sector. So it's only fair that they all have the same closing time. That's what this is about. And so I appreciate, again, Council Vice President Stewart uh, and Council Member Albernaz. I appreciate Ms. McCartney Green uh, and the County Executive staff, um, Dr. Stoddart as well, uh, because we have been listening to the residents. We've been listening to the business owners. And this is what they're asking for. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. We'll note again that the uh, third uh, co-lead uh, on this bill, Councilmember Albernas, has joined us virtually. Uh, with that, let me turn it to colleagues. Uh, we have several in the queue, starting with Councilmember Juwanda. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, I want to thank uh, Councilmember Stewart for her efforts to address public safety in downtown Silver Spring. Uh, and uh, I know it's coming from a genuine place, and I think we're all trying to do that. Um, uh, as she knows, and I think my colleagues know, I, I, I've told this story before. I've not only grew up in Silver Spring, but particularly on Bonifant. You know, my, my dad's print shop was on that street, got my tattoo on that street. Uh, and um, uh, and uh, several of the business owners on, and also got haircuts on, at Ebony Barber's on that street. So I, I spent a lot of time uh, over the last 41 years on that street and in that area. Um, and and working on this issue. Um, it's something, you know, as colleagues know, uh, going several years ago, convening meetings with the late night community and our law enforcement officers uh, that have been fru uh, fruitful. And I want to thank Dr. Stoddard for his support of those efforts and Captain Reed and others uh, for, for doing those meetings. Um, I have to say I've shared with colleagues uh, with mem I've shared several memos with colleagues, uh, and there are two. Uh, there's an addendum to this agenda. Uh, I, I'm very concerned with moving forward with this bill at this time. Uh, the, the three concerns uh, are outlined as such: there's insufficient information before the council to make a data-driven deci decision regarding limiting hours of these private businesses, particularly related to crime. Uh, Two, and I'll come back to that too, the impact of the hours themselves, the limitations and the impact that they're gonna have on businesses has not been fully evaluated. Uh, and three, the county has yet to implement the late night business safety plan uh, that we passed a year ago or last February and to term determine the effectiveness of that measure. Uh, we just passed the regulations last week. There hasn't been a safety plan written uh, and it was particularly discussed at the time as a first step to see how that would go uh, before we took more uh, draconian steps. When it comes to the data-driven decision that I mentioned, uh, we don't have complete information regarding late night business operations and crime data. I had requested from the department hour by hour data on the crime statistics in Silver Spring. Uh, that request is still partially pending. Uh, they did provide a breakdown between the two to seven hour, but that is not helpful in the sense that there's no comparison. Uh, in two to seven, as was mentioned by the sponsor, these businesses are the only businesses open in the county. So to compare them to something that's not open, of course, that's where people are located. There will be calls for service where people are. Um, and so I don't think we would need to know what's going on at 11 and 12 and one. Uh, in other parts of the county that have nightlife and things that are happening during the day. Uh, we've uh, requested that. Uh, one of my amendments today will uh, address that. Uh, I don't think we can take this step without understanding that. Uh, 
I'm concerned, too, that this bill will put small businesses, most of them, if not all of them, black and immigrant owned, out of business. Um, and I don't think that's something the government should do, uh, determine winners and lo losers. We've talked to three, uh, more than three, but we've got data from three of the hookah lounges uh, that submitted their ledgers and how the money they make, hours in between two and seven and before that time. Uh, and they make between 80 and 90 percent of their money during those hours. So if you take 80 or 90 percent of money from any business, you're shutting them down. This is not equity. It's not fairness. It's they're going to be shut down. And that's their business model. They don't serve alcohol. They don't they're not allowed to serve food. Uh, there's a bill in Annapolis that needs to change to help that. But they make their money during these hours. Uh, in conversations with Captain Reed and others and Dr. Stoddard and others over the years, it has been stated and they can I'll ask them this again, that the hookah lounges are not the problem. There's not problems going on in the hookah lounges. The problems are when large numbers of people exit onto the street. That to me speaks to we need to have an infrastructure in downtown Silver Spring, whether it's at two when the bars let out or at five when or six when these folks are letting out to support those transitions. I, and and that's, that's, I think, and the other things that we talked about, cameras and other things. But this bill, as the economic impact statement said, would have a negative impact on both businesses themselves and the employees. And it did so without the financial data that I just mentioned, showing that this will shut the bills down. Now, some may want that, but let's just talk about what it will do. And that's what the business owners have said. If you take 85 to 90 percent of their income, they will shut down. They that's when they make their money. I've seen the receipts. Happy to provide it to council members. It's clearly marked and demar demarcated from their income statements. And I and I just think we that's something that government should not do, absent knowing that these are the cause of of crime. And 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 we don't have the evidence to to prove that. Um, I'm deeply, deeply committed to addressing crime in downtown Silver Spring as I know, and across the county, as I know counties are, are, our colleagues are. Uh, but I just think this is a, 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 a something that we have not fully evaluated that will disproportionately target these businesses who are not responsible for the uh, majority of crime in downtown Silver Spring. Um, so accordingly, uh, I've put forward two amendments for consideration, and I'm going to move the first now. Uh, which would modify the bill to allow late night businesses to operate without retirement restriction on Saturday evenings only. Currently they can do it seven days a week, but this would just allow on Saturday evenings. So six nights out of the week, they would be subject to the same uh, restrictions under the bill. And it would require the Montgomery County Police Department also to study the differences in crime trends for hookah, tobacco and vape shops that operate under the newly restricted hours for Sunday evenings through Friday evenings, the times when this is in effect, and to compare it. So we have a comparison and then report back to the council within six months. Again, I just can't emphasize enough, this bill as currently drafted will shut these businesses down. I feel like we owe the due diligence to at least allow a little bit of analysis time while still also addressing some of the concerns that colleagues have uh, with this amendment. So at this time, uh, I would move that amendment. Okay, there's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Councilmember Sales. Uh, we have a colleague in the queue. Did you want to speak to this amendment or you want? No, I'm just okay, is there a discussion on this amendment? Okay, all those in favor of this amendment, please raise your hand. Oh, did you want to yes, speak to this yes. amendment? Okay. Yes. Um, I just wanted to thank my uh, colleagues for introducing the legislation and keeping this issue top of mind. But I did have a few questions, if I can, before. Or are we? Is it on this amendment? Yes. Okay. Okay. Because um, as Councilmember Jawando stated, and as the OLO report. Um, indicated, you know, there is a fiscal, a negative fiscal impact to this legislation. Um, you know, I do agree that we need to ensure that there is data included um, uh, in this um, uh, packet that um, 
points to the hour by hour um, incidents that have been reported. I'm looking at the information that was included from um, the year over year data from 2022, 2023, and 2024. I'm so glad you're here, Commander Bain. Um, I just wanted to better understand since we've, we're only into four months into 2024, do we have um, the first four months of 2022 and 2023 to accurately compare? So that data is being calculated right now. The report that you have, uh, the updated report, was extremely labor intensive by our criminal an uh, crime analysts, okay. which did a phenomenal job. And we are continuing to see that, but we are continuing to see an increase as seen in the report for calls for service from 2022 to 2023. And as it stands right now, going into 2024, it looks like that increase will continue. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I also had a, a question at the um, the heat map that um, the regarding the fiscal impact. Um, do we have any um, information regarding the revenue these businesses make uh, regarding the hours um, and how much they will lose with the new restrictions? I don't know if that was indicated in. No, that was not available. Okay. And are we able to get that information? I preliminary made an inquiry to OLO just asking for that. Um, and uh, based on the uh, spillover effect of after 2 a.m., uh, a lot of um, consumers that are at restaurants or bars would, would go to these um, locations. The conclusion was that obviously if that they're closed during the after 2 a.m., 5 a.m., they would lose res re revenue. but. Um, there was no uh, data that was provided. Also, a part of that discussion was that uh, the negative effects as well um, on other businesses that because of the overflow or um, noise or, or complaints that other businesses were losing, but that also wasn't quantified of what that loss would be. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I don't know if this was included, but I didn't see any information about the uh, commercial rent per square foot to see how much they will lose in rent, what the rental fees are, um, how they're going to make up this revenue, what employees um, are going to lose salary wages, et cetera. Was this calculated in the fiscal impact? No, a lot of those things are proprietary depending on the business, and so that wasn't yeah. readily provided. Um, and so that, that wasn't available. From my understanding, and I'm only speaking off of what was read in the economic statement and uh, inquiry that I made on behalf of uh, the analysts to, to see if that was available, and it wasn't. Um, the also perspective was that there were 13 lounges, and so that the impact wasn't going to be um, magnified because of the small amount of um, lounges that were in that area. Thank you. And I will note that as the county's lead for eliminating disparities in public health, uh, the alcohol-related disease impact application estimates that each year there are more than 178,000 deaths, approximately 120,000 male deaths, and 59,000 female deaths attributed to excessive alcohol use, making alcohol one of the leading preventable causes of death in the United States behind tobacco, poor diet, and physical inactivity and illegal drugs. I yield. Okay. Um, uh, let me turn it to uh, Councilmember Mink, um, and then I did want to turn it to the executive branch, but uh, to speak to the data uh, a bit. Uh, but let me turn it to Councilmember Mink first. Actually, I'll yield for that. Okay. okay thanks. Um, Dr. Stoddard, if you could uh, speak yeah, to the data. Yeah, I would say, here's, here's what I would say. I would concede the point that I think it's pretty clear that there would be a pretty negative impact on the 13 businesses that would be closed earlier. I think what, uh, and I think this was alluded to um, um, already, we don't know what the impact is of the public safety issues that are created during those hours on the other businesses that immediately precede them, and that hasn't been documented either. But I think from having spent more than one night down in downtown Silver Spring. I, I've spent more than one early morning in downtown Silver Spring uh, w with uh, Captain Reed and, and, and some of the, 
the uh, officers detailed. Um, Officer Boone is uh, most of my recent most recent salon. I've done we've done a several with uh, seen Brett down there several times and and the the staff there overnight. Um, what does happen is the bars let out and they do, people do uh, proceed on to these establishments. They do stay there until five, six, seven in the morning. The establishments, particularly on Bonifit Street, let out one into one another. You have all kinds of, uh, um, I observe personally, so I can say this, you know, uh, uh, fights, um, inter, you know, altercations, and was sitting in the cruiser with, a, with an officer and he essentially said to me, I can't go intercede on this because I'm by myself. You know, and essentially, you know, I, if it gets bigger, I'll have to call for more support because that, you know, that's the reality. Um, when we were doing late night enforcement in the space, uh, we couldn't even get into the hookah lounges because they were so packed that there was at least a 15 to 20 minute delay for the inspectors to get into the establishment until they could clear enough space for them to be able to get through and get do the work of do the inspections. And so, uh, these establishments are very busy during this time. There's, it's indisputable the impact, the economic impact would be real to these businesses. However, uh, this is an equity issue. And what I mean by that is these 13 businesses are taking a disproportionate level of public resource. And that public resource is therefore being denied to the other 200 businesses that are operating at seven o'clock or whatever, however many are operating at seven o'clock. Those officers are being disproportionately tied up doing the work to protect the occupants and, and uh, employees of those 13. And so I would not dispute at all that the calls for service data says that it is busier in downtown Silver Spring at seven o'clock than it is at three o'clock. However, when your 13 businesses are driving the calls that you see at three o'clock are X, they're not the same ratio as what you're seeing at seven o'clock when there are hundreds of businesses operating concurrently in Silver Silver Spring. So if we're talking at per capita or per Per business impact on public safety, <clears throat> it is very disproportionate uh, what's being driven by these 13. And you can see that uh, in the countywide data where there are not other businesses operating in the county. You can see what the baseline calls for service in other areas, including urban areas like Bethesda or uh, Wheaton. You can see what those baseline calls for service would be. And they're not zero, but they're not what you see in, in and around the thir these 13 particular businesses in town down Silver Spring. So I think that's, you know, that data is pretty clear. And I, I feel very confident about that. I don't have an issue with us going back and doing the hour by hour. I think that we could do that. It would be onerous as, as, as Captain Reed alluded to. And frankly, prospectively, it'd be a lot easier for us to do prospectively than it would be to go ret retroactively and look back over multiple years to try and tease those things out. And so if that's something the council wanted, we would make that work. Um, but at the end of the day, I think having spent a fair bit of time in downtown Silver Spring to talk to the officers and what they observe, uh, I feel pretty confident that um, we would see a reduction, a significant reduction in calls for service with enactment of this legislation. Thank you, Councilman Mink. If there are others in the queue, can I get in behind them? Because I'm thinking over what we're just Sure. Saying. Thanks. I'll uh, put you back in the queue. We have Council Vice President Stewart. Thank you. I think um, as we're all letting information, I appreciate um, the response from uh, Dr. Stoddard and Captain Reed. Thank you for joining us. Um, so I think you've answered some of the questions on the data thing, um, piece of this. And I think, you know, uh, looking at my colleagues, the chair of public safety and economic development, um, both chairs, I know that these are issues that are ongoing and and looking at in uh, in the future. So I would you know look to them for a commitment of keeping this front in mind. I don't think we need to have this put into the um, the bill. Um, and I do think that as uh, Council Member Sales mentioned about alcohol, I think that's a really good point. And we restrict when our bars and places that serve alcohol are open. And right now, as as I said, I think. I really want to lift up the public health concerns because this came to me as Council Member Glass said when I was very first elected and I know Council Member Glass and Albernaz were looking at this longer than I have and as well as Council Member Jamondo. Um, and it has been more recent that I've talked to folks and you know really dug into the health impacts of it. And so I just if we're going to track things like it's harder to track these health impacts. And so 
again, I look towards my colleagues who are on the chair of public safety and economic development to look at these things. And I know Council Member Albanaz as chair of HHS and his great work on looking at vaping in our community and other things, will continue to look at the impact of hookah on public health. I think these are all things we can look at as we're moving forward. Um, and we don't need to put this um, as in this bill right now, but what we do need is to prioritize the public health and safety. And I, and I think we have the data to do that, to move forward. Thank you. Thank you. We turn it to uh, Councilmember Albernaz, who is with us virtually. Um, thanks, everybody. I apologize for not being in there in person. Just full disclosure, we're on a family trip uh, in Santiago, Chile, and we're actually in the south of Chile right now. Uh, it's the 30 year anniversary of my grandparents passing. Um, and so my mom is taking us around and my kids are seeing where she was born, where my, my grandparents were born, and it, we just couldn't pass this trip up. But, but thank you all so much for um, your patience. Um, but I just will mention quickly, because it hasn't been mentioned yet. Um, this is, to me, a very common sense issue. We do not have the infrastructure for this, plain and simple. We are receiving people from around the region, not just Montgomery County, who are coming to our county from bars that close at 2 or 3 a.m. in Prince George's, in the District of Columbia, and in other parts of the region. And we do not have the public safety infrastructure to be able to handle this. We didn't two years ago, and we certainly don't now. And so I believe strongly that while I do recognize, as all of my colleagues have, that this will disproportionately impact the 13 businesses, this is very much a public safety issue. And as Council Member Stewart noted, a public health issue as well. And so, for all those reasons, I was prepared to do this and actually close earlier to. Any longer, uh, we've had numerous high profile in, in incidences involving uh, weapons and murders. Uh, we've heard from businesses that wake up each morning to uh, littered trash and other, um, you know, other challenges that, that severely impact their ability to operate effectively. Uh, we heard testimony from businesses that have to pick up condoms uh, and a number of other terrible items. And so I think it, this is long past due. And while I understand the need to analyze, we also need to use common sense. And so for all those reasons and probably more, um, I won't support this amendment. I won't support the other amendment, but I am going to support the vote as was done in in committees but uh with that i yield back to you mr president thank you um let me turn it now to councilmember jawanda okay I said i had another person but that's you. i thought there was some no one's in front of me okay no i i trust you you have the you have the the thing in front of you um I appreciate that. Just wanted to mention a couple things. And, and Dr. Stoddard, I appreciate you acknowledging that this, you know, I've been down there too late and I, you've seen the flow of traffic. Um, I just want to reiterate, you know, I miss, I know Ms. McCartney Green hasn't requested this or seen the official from OLO, but I have in the data from these, at least three of the businesses that stay open and they will, you know, they will be shut down. So this is this is in a this is not a equity. It's not. I just we need to understand that they will be gone. Um, and again, some may want that. And and if I and I just think we have to be clear about that. I don't think that is a fair or equitable. Um, the people who go to do hookah, I'm not one of them, but uh, take it upon themselves to go into these establishments and, and do that. The people that work there choose to do so, uh, and. These are small businesses, um, and to say that this is now a health bill—it's this was a crime bill. This is the way it was introduced, and and I think there are health impacts, absolutely, but it it was introduced and has been talked about primarily as a crime reduction bill. We haven't established that this will reduce crime. Uh, Captain Reed, I know you're. Can I ask you a question here? Uh, is it still your view that that? Uh, Closing these establishments, uh, that, excuse me, 
I asked this before, but didn't let you respond. Is it still your view that the problems are not within the establishments themselves? So when we started this, we never wanted to focus on the establishments. We wanted to focus on the crime because we didn't want to any establishments to be singled out. But more and more was coming out that the establishments were going to be affected. So we actually went back into and then the 13 establishments that had addresses located, we went back and looked and there were 155 calls for service between 2 a.m. and 7 a.m. at these establishments. And if you look at the data- At or in front of or outside of? At that location. Like saying, because saying, I know you could say that, that, hey, look, we're at this place and there's something happening in the street. Without going back to inside. each individual yeah. report and actually reading the report and say we located a fight inside this establishment, it's uh, it would take a so lot. You're not of, sure. Not sure. Okay. But these were the calls for service that officers responded to, okay. um, and and as you as we went into the data that we looked at 2 a.m. to 7 a.m. and like I said, our crime analysts did a phenomenal job. The um, what we found disturbing is the spike in crime between 6 a.m. and 7 a.m. in the hot spot areas. So. And like um, Dr. Stoddard alluded to, we simply don't have the resources to continue to go. What we what we have seen through our uh, walking around downtown Silver Spring is we're we're really stripping the rest of uh, the district in order for officers to stay downtown because between 2 a.m. and 3 a.m. the disorderly conduct calls. Uh, during those hotspot areas go up 52 percent. Those are the fights. Those are the things that like he alluded to with Dr. Stoddard. Mm -hmm. Officers simply said, I can't deal with this right now because there's 30 people fighting and it's just me. And so now I have to call other areas of the district in order for other areas to come down. So now we're stripping other areas of the county. So that, that that's the problem we're running into. Understood. I, and I understand the capacity issues. I think that's also true at 1 a.m. Is it not? But we have additional officers down there in, in order to supplement the officers. What our thing is, it's an unsustainable resource. We, we're bringing in tactical officers from SOD. We're bringing in our motor officers to help us out. We've, uh, we've got a great working relationship well, no, I, with Maryland I, State I, Police. And not to cut you off, I understand that. But what I'm saying is, isn't it also a capacity issue at 1 a.m.? But we see the um, the influx between two and three a.m. on our calls for service for the fight calls. Okay, and because I, you know, I I agree that there are structural capacity issues, you know, whether it be at the Fillmore, or any a number of places where there's large congregation, large amounts of people that will be congregating at any time, but particularly at late at night. Um, but you, so you're to the first question, you were saying you're not sure if all the calls for service that you've seen were inside the establishments, but they were there. That was the reference point that was given. So you can't say for sure whether it was inside or outside. The only thing I can tell you is that's the address that was the right. Um, right. The, the individual yeah. who called. Okay. Dr. Stoddard, are you trying no, to No, I was going to, I was going to confirm, you know, basically in our CAD system, it's, everything's tied to an address. And we've talked about this in other contexts before. So it, you know, it's not up the, it's not the, the block, the corner of the street that's being, we're including this, where it's specifically the street address of the right. establishments. Right. So those 155 calls um, were tied to. And we don't know what the 150, this is the part of the data that I requested. We don't know the 155 calls versus like 11 PM in another area where there's nightlife. You can't compare that because we just don't have that right now you you can't but i i would concede the point i think it's i don't think it's but i think the data would very much show the calls for service are higher at 11 p.m than they are at 3 a.m in other parts of the county uh i don't know about that because obviously it depends yeah. on or depending on where there's you don't yes know, you can't, you depending can't, on where it's say, at yeah. um depending on what the night activity is i think you would see that however i still think we come back to this point that is these 13 businesses are driving a public allocation of resources that is disproportionate right. to their to the activity that sure. they're generating. That's the larger issue. Now, in some universe where we had unlimited policing resources, I think that it would be less of an issue than we're seeing currently because of the crunch that we're facing. So we're, we're, we are functionally denying larger numbers of businesses and residents the opportunity to receive police services and more more timely calls for responses to calls for service because we're having to staff later into the evening in this one yeah. particular part and, of the county. And, and, and you're drawing that conclusion 
because you know obviously between two and seven there's nothing open other than these businesses in the county right so or uh, so we know three, what we have to staff in downtown Silver Spring, so I know how many officers are tied up during that shift yeah. in downtown Silver Spring sure. versus downtown Wheaton or downtown Bethesda right. or other urban centers in the county. Um, and so we know that there's officers who are staffed between 2 and 7 a.m. who would not otherwise be staffed at 2 to 7 a.m. They'd yeah, be course. in other shifts. No, that, that makes sense. But what I'm saying is that there's, there's probably, I would assume, we don't have this data either, that there's less calls for service in the county between 2 and 7 a.m. Yes. Right. Yes, so absolutely. there's less happening in of other course, places, right? So the reallocation, while a concern, but it's it, it they're, 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 it's in the context of less happening of other yeah, places. But, but you wouldn't you don't staff two to seven a.m. Right. There's less people with staffed anyway. Fifteen people, Got right? It. Understood. You, you you would do it with twelve, and you'd have those three officers available to earlier shifts sure. to help out with the higher calls for service volume. And so it 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 adds. Up, I mean, when we're when we are when we're at the staffing levels that we are at now the extra staffing that we have to provide between 2 and 7 a.m. matters because it functionally increases the, the time to respond to calls for service earlier in the evenings when there are more businesses operating and more more activity both across the county yeah. and in downtown. But isn't, that, isn't, isn't that also true at 1 a.m.? There is more, I, I, I'm not sure, what, is it busier at 1 a.m. than it is at we have if you're going to have an urban nightlife you're going to have to staff up for that yes conceded the issue is the majority of the nightlife ends at two and you you can start to down staff or three you know, depending, three, on, you know, depending on two or three um but in downtown silver spring uniquely there are a set of businesses 13 in this case who are driving a much more protracted period of, of high By virtue of service. people being there yes i concede the point 100 yeah. percent we're talking about my amendment that's before us would add two hours on one day, right? Uh, not seven days, two hours on one day. In the two days that the data that I, I have received and have presented to the council today, where they make 85 to 90% of their income, right? Uh, wouldn't it be easier to have one day where you had late night as opposed to six days, seven days? It would be easier, but I, would, I actually would, would contest the point that they're actually staying up between two to 7 a.m. on most weekday nights anyway. No, it's probably Thursday to Sunday. Right. Yeah. So my, right. So my, well, I, I'm not even sure it's Thursday. I'm not even sure it's, so having, what I've seen in Silver Spring is, is very interesting because you can see what's listed on a website for the opening and closing times. The reality is the businesses stay open longer or go close earlier depending on what's actually happening that particular night. Having that, this is true of the, of the bars and restaurants and it's true of the hookah lounges. If it's a busy night, they tend to, the, obviously the alcohol, they have to, close at a certain time, but who could, if it's busy, they'll stay open. If it's not busy, they'll tend to close early and send their employees somewhere. Like early. any restaurant would do too. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so place. I think that, you know, that's the tricky part about all this is you can, discerning what someone's actually open is in part just observable data. You can't like, okay, this is what they're scheduled to be open, therefore that's what they're open. Because we've been down there on Friday nights and it's been a quiet night in downtown Surf Spring, a bunch of the bars closed and a bunch of hookah lounges never end up, they end up closing at two o'clock too. On other nights, it's, it's, a, you know, it's a nice summer evening. The bars are all super busy. The bars are all super busy. Those people who get out at two o'clock, some portion of them head over to the hookah lounges. The hookah lounges are inherently smaller than the bars themselves. You end up packing a bunch of people into a small space. Sometimes that leads to fights outside or to, uh, you know, car thefts or things things of that nature that that are just associate. I totally associate with people. I think the hardest part about this and having thought about this safety plan issue for a, for a while now is you are correct that a lot of the issues are not happening specifically in the hookah lounges all the time they're spilling out into the street. And therefore, how is it the hookah lounge's security can even police the behavior of their patrons once they walk outside the door? Right. The reality is they can't. But that doesn't change the fact that if you're in the Bonifit and you're hearing- Sure, that doesn't uh, change the yeah. fact that something's happening, which is why, again, again, this is why we need a larger infrastructure solution. And I know you're not against that, you're for that too, um, but to shut down 13 businesses, which will be the effect of this bill, uh, and I'm trying to mitigate that by allowing one day that they have the flexibility to be open, to your point, that they might not even use it, depending on what's going on. Uh, but from them, they said Friday and Saturday are the hours when they stay open. That would be my experience from having been down there. Uh, and that would allow them to have a chance. Um, and and I just, 
I think, you know, the, a lot of the amendments, this bill was introduced in February. It's going to be expedited. A lot of the, uh, it's been a very quick turnaround as far as the bill process. And again, we haven't inf instituted the safety plan. When you and I talked about this last year, Dr. Stoddard, you, it was your view, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that the safety plan bill would have more of an impact than shutting people down. It will have a broader impact because it doesn't just apply to the hookah lounges, obviously. Right. I think that's the, that would have a broader impact in that way. And, and I still, we're still proceeding forward with, in, in, regardless of what happens with this particular bill, we're, we're proceeding forward with the safety plan bill. So even, even if the council were to pass unamended what's before the council today, we would still put forward the safety plan bill. And I still think that there would be business, there are, I, I won't name them, there are specific businesses that are bars that are, are problematic establishments as well that I think the safety plan would very much yeah. likely be applying to in the next year as we as we count those serious incidents where I have significant concerns about what happens in those establishments that, that is there are there are good actors and bad actors understood and all the businesses that we're going to shut down today you don't necessarily have significant concerns that's what's going on inside those establishments I would not say that in, I wouldn't say that in all of them are bad actors I would not say that all of them are good right. actors either uh, so I would say that about probably my kids most days too. That's but fair. But the, Mine as well. the, the, these they're all getting swept up in this bill, and 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 I think that's part of the problem here that we're not we are going to shut down businesses with not understanding the full. Co Councilor Drudder, we have your amendment before yeah, us. Understood. You could, I, I'm, I'm, I'm need to wrap point. up because yeah, we've given you a lot of courtesy well, here. I appreciate that, and I appreciate that. Um, I'll yield. Thank you. Okay, we have a number of colleagues in the queue. I would ask that we have an amendment before us that we stick to the amendment. We need to take a vote on that amendment, and then we'll entertain any other amendments, and then ultimately to take a vote on the bill. Uh, Councilmember Lukey. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I appreciate the the bill as is bringing parity to business operations, which I think is incredibly critical. And I recall. Prior to going to law school and coming here to Maryland, I worked for the Tobacco Products Liability Project, and I greatly appreciate Councilmember Stort reviewing that data. One of the things I found so significant then was how cigarette companies had tested light cigarettes, and they didn't factor in the occlusion of the fingers over the perforations that went around the filter. So they weren't measuring accurately what was, was given in. And so the statistic that Councilmember Stort raised about the intake for hookah being 200 times that of a cigarette is is pretty astounding. Um, but I also noted at that time the first district place locality that I worked with on um, no smoking regulations was Friendship Heights. It was the first time I heard of Friendship Heights, Maryland. And, uh, and there was a lot of consternation that doing these types of things were going to cause businesses to shut down, particularly bars, pubs, places like that. And it didn't. And Ireland, as a nation, the Republic of Ireland went smoke-free, all in one fell swoop, cold turkey, not piecemeal like we did here in the United States. And the bars are still open, and everybody's still engaged in traditional Irish pub culture and music making. Um, so I, I get the fear, but I also appreciate the need to have consistency and predictability for the closing times of the businesses and I note that there's a Senate bill presently before the state uh, Senate bill 774 which treats again hookah uh, establishments licensed to serve alcoholic beverages and um, establishments that regularly host live entertainment where they're concentrated in a high density and half mile areas like downtown Silver Spring and it treats those three types of businesses the same and that's what the bill as originally introduced here is attempting to do. And um, to the point with respect to the late night safety plan bill, and at that time I said this is a really good risk management tool that everyone should be availing themselves. And certainly whether you're required to do it under the law or not, you can do it. And I appreciate, thank you, Captain Reed and your team for the, of the folks who go down there and work collaboratively with those businesses. And Dr. Stoddard, I know you have been, you probably should have platinum sta status right now on ride alongs. So I appreciate you and your level of effort. But the late night safety plan and this bill are not either 
uh, you know, it's not an either or. These are ands, and they are both necessary um, in order to address the concerns of the residents in the area, the other businesses in the area, and certainly the executive branch and, and police department, um, as noted. So with that, I ask, uh, or I will not be supporting the amendments, but I do wholeheartedly support the bill as introduced. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Sales. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Um, as I conveyed during the joint committee session, I'm fully supportive of safe and secure communities. That's why I voted for Bill 1423, the late night business safety plan. And Councilmember Lukey brought up a good point, um, trying to create parity. The only problem is there is no parity with these businesses. They cannot sell alcohol, they cannot sell food. So there is no parity when we're taking away the hours when they can actually sell the the uh, stuff that they have been open to uh, sell to their um, their consumers. So um, I'm you know I want us if we're we're going to talk about parity, um, we have to ensure that all the facts are clear. Um, data is missing regarding um, the hour by hour analyses. Data is missing regarding the connections, direct connections to these hookah lounges to actual public safety issues. Uh, the top three calls, causes for calls for service are trespassing, suspicious persons, and disorderly conduct, not directly at these establishments. And so I want us to be clear that we are, I feel like this is whack-a-mole. We're trying to address a problem. We're just going to throw this at the wall. And, you know, if these businesses are impacted, then so be it. Uh, the county has been in the alcohol business for years. So if we want to talk about public health impacts, we need to take a holistic approach to what sort of licenses we are approving. And if we want to go down that rabbit hole, we can do that. Um, but this is not a public health bill. This is a public safety bill that will impact businesses negatively. I yield. Thank you, Councilmember Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, during the discussions that we had at public safety, the joint committee meeting, public safety and economic development, I, I certainly mentioned that I'm a, a strong advocate for small businesses and I also believe every small business needs to be a good neighbor. And I believe that part of the discussion that we are having for the 13 businesses that are discussed today, that they perhaps have not been as good a neighbor as they should have been all along. That is when you need legislation to say you need to do something different. I do believe that uh, it was mentioned that we should continue to evaluate if this legislation passes, and I certainly hope it will, and I will not support the amendments, but if it passes and quite candidly, if we need to evaluate what the times that we would be looking at. I think public safety as well as economic development should continue to do that. And I think we have to be very clear that there's a great possibility that during those discussions, keep an open mind, but that means maybe that this is still too late for these businesses to be open. If someone wants to use a hookah bar, they don't have to wait till 3 o'clock in the morning to do it. They could go in that bar when it's open and, and use those services at that time. So I believe, just like any, any business that we say that you can't drink past a certain hour, if someone wants to go to that restaurant and have a drink, they figure out how to get there during the hours that they're open. I believe that, that the question should be, whether or not this legislation is good legislation, and it is, I believe the amendments are not uh, amendments that I would support. And Mr. President, candidly, I think we're going round and round. At some point, I'm happy to call the call the uh, question, please. Okay. Well, we have three colleagues in the queue. Uh, well, I'll, I'll let the three the, colleagues, yeah. but <laughs> I'm gonna. Cut it off, and we'll, we'll I'll take your call for the for the for the question okay. after the three, if that's amenable to you. Now we have two colleagues uh, in the queue. Uh, uh, Councilmember Meng. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that this uh, bill was written in response to legitimate concerns. 
And I also appreciate that these amendments were, are being presented in response to legitimate concerns about the bill. So I just want to acknowledge uh, both of those and appreciate both of those. Um, I think that the compromise lies in what uh, Chair Katz alluded to, which also I think uh, uh, Councilmember Jawando's Second Amendment uh, is responsive to as well, which is around the data analysis and the follow-up about the implementation. And this is something that I spoke about in committee as well, that um, the importance of following up quickly on this to make sure that we're getting as thorough data as possible to take a look at the impact that this and the other uh, the uh, public safety plan bill, uh, the impact that those are having, um, as well as, and this isn't written into the amendment and wouldn't be appropriate probably because this is a bill that's about public safety but um, and, and crime, but also to do a follow-up that includes uh, the economic impact on the businesses as well, I think uh, would make a lot of sense and would fit into our uh, joint, com uh, uh, joint committee sessions nicely. So. Um, I would I, I understand the sense of the council here, but I do want to emphasize the importance of us circling back within a rapid time frame uh, to look at an analysis of the impact, hour by hour crime impact, um, as well as following up with the businesses, and that that should be done uh, as, as early as possible so that we can have a good understanding of the impact that this is having um, both on the community at large, on crime, and on the businesses. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Balcom. I'll be brief. Uh, I just want to talk about the delineation between crimes that are happening inside the hookah lounge versus outside. I think that's a false dichotomy. The The crimes that, that's happening between 3 and 7 or 2 and 7 in the morning wouldn't, wouldn't happen if the people weren't there at the hookah lounge. So I think that's a, just a false uh, dichotomy. And then the issue with the uh, alcohol, it, uh, again, it, it, it's a very good point but we close bars mm -hmm. at a certain time for that very reason. So this is a public safety bill. Uh, that's what resonates with me, and um, I support the closure the closure times. Thank you. Very briefly, Councilmember Glass. Very briefly, uh, thank you, Councilmember Balcom. I have a question for Ms. McCartney Green. Uh, legally, if a call of service is made, and there are people outside the establishment. What is the relationship between that call of service to people outside the establishment and the business in which they were once in? Who's at fault? And Councilmember Glass, I just want to, can I back up a little bit just to frame the conversation? And I, I, I apologize, Please. but just want the council to take a step back that case law in Baltimore County gives us the foundational piece to be able to put restrictions on who allows us because we've seen how that was implemented in that county. With, with that being said, um, if there are crime in or near the case law, looking at that case law, that was sufficient grounds for legislative enactment concerning crimes that were related or uh, supplemental. And so I know we've gotten to a piece of is it inside or is it outside, um, but if it was related um, and looking at that case law, there were calls for services um, that were upwards of the hundreds up into a thousand, that was sufficient grounds to implement a public safety measure on behalf of, of um, legislation that was enacted. So using that as a foundation, uh, of course, if we have more data to show specifically which lounges, um, and specifically in that case, there was that specific lounge where there was actually a, a murder that actually happened inside, and so that further supplemented um, um, the data there. But whether it's in or near, the fact that we have a heat map that shows that they were near uh, crimes, whether it was weapons or stabbings or killings, those are all uh, related. So I want to just frame that and just ask you to ask your question one more time so I can answer that. You've already answered it. Thank you very much. Okay. The, qu the question has been called. There's an amendment uh, before the body. Uh, all those in favor of the amendment uh, moved by Councilmember Jawano, seconded by Councilmember Sales, please raise your hand. That is two. All those opposed? That's seven, eight, uh, and are there any abstentions? And one abstention. So two, four, seven opposed, and one abstention. Uh, okay, um, I will open the floor up to any other amendments. Councilmember Jawanda. Yeah, I, I won't offer it just to save time. I will say to my, my friend here, and he is my friend, 
you know, the conversation in committee took about 25 minutes. So this was warranted and necessary to shut down businesses. So I don't appreciate the, the suggestion that we shouldn't have this conversation. I didn't suggest um, And so I, I, I hope that also that the joint committee will follow up and get this data. I, I've requested that. I know you're working on it. I hope we can have a larger conversation in the operating budget about data we have. We've been talking about this, your capabilities to be able to analyze it and to target better. Um, I think that's something many, I've heard Councilmember Lukey talk about this in committee. Um, I have really significant concerns about our ability to process data and target appropriately. So I know we've talked about that. Uh, so with that, I, I yield and I won't offer the second amendment. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Fani Gonzalez. As the, one of the co-chairs for this joint session, I also commit to follow up and um, work with Councilmember Katz um, to have a conversation on the data. And I, don't, I agree with you, it's very significant, significant and important. I, I'm just going to put on the record, as I mentioned during the joint uh, committee session, I, I'm going to support this bill because I think this is about public safety. Um, the comments about health, I, I got to say, I smoke shisha. It's, shisha is a tobacco flavor. Uh, it's, it's culture for me, as some people may know, my background is from Lebanon, and I I don't do it every day, I do it every now and then, um, but I, I just wanna put that out there that I'm not supporting this because of health concerns, I'm doing it because of public safety reasons. That's it, that's what was on the report. And uh, with that, I'm gonna yield back to the council president, hopefully we can move forward. Okay, thank you to colleagues. Thanks for the discussion. I don't see any other colleagues in the queue. Uh, we don't have any amendments here, so we have a joint committee recommendation uh, before us. This is a roll call vote. As amend I'm sorry, Council. Uh, there were amendments in committee, and so as, as amended. Well, the, the, yeah. the committee's recommendation has not been amended, so the way that we function here is the. Sorry, I just want to make sure. The, the the committee amended the bill correct but but what is before us is a committee recommendation under our protocol we don't have to take a motion on that we have a committee recommendation before us since it hasn't been uh, amended therefore we can go straight to a roll call vote uh, sorry thank you for the clarification making sure that I'm doing things the right way but in this rare case I think I did get it right uh, madam clerk please uh, could you call the roll council member Lutke? yes council member Lutke votes yes Council Member Mink? Yes. Council Member Mink votes yes. Council Member Sales? Yes. Council Member Sales votes yes. Council Member Glass? Yes. Council Member Glass votes yes. Council Member Jawando? No. Council Member Jawando votes no. Council Member Katz? Yes. Council Member Katz votes yes. Council Member Albernaz? Yes. Council Member Albernaz votes yes. Council Member Fani Gonzalez? Yes. Council Member Fani Gonzalez votes yes. Council Member Balcom? Yes. Council Member Balcom votes yes. Council Member Stewart? Yes. Council Member Stewart votes yes. Council Member Friedson? Yes. Council Member Friedson votes yes. Great. Uh, thank you. That passes. Um, and appreciate the, the conversation, the discussion. We're now going to move on to item three uh, for our morning, which is the consent calendar. Uh, uh, I I think there might be a comment, but we'll wait till after uh, on that. Um, so is there a motion to approve the consent calendar? So moved. Moved by Councilmember Katz, seconded by Councilmember Lukey. All those in favor, please raise your hand. That is unanimous among those virtual and present. Uh, so the consent calendar has been approved. Let me turn it briefly to Councilmember Glass. Thank you, Mr. President. I just want to draw colleagues and the public's attention to item K which is the regulation we just approved uh, to move forward the incentive program for uh, electric leaf removal equipment. Uh, lots of conversation, uh, especially as it's springtime, and just want everyone to know what this regulation will do. Uh, it establishes a rebate program that allows county residents to be able to receive up to $100 uh, for eligible purchases of electric leaf blower equipment. and. Small businesses with fewer than five employees can qualify for up to 250, uh, uh, with revenue of less than $250,000, can get a rebate of up to $1,500 every calendar year for the rebate program. So uh, as we 
move forward and, and garden. Uh, it will get a little cleaner in the air. It will get a little quieter in the air. Uh, and I'm glad we're moving forward on this. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. And I just want to draw attention to item J, the Nonprofit Preservation Fund. This is uh, nearly $20 million that is being uh, appropriated from loan repayment proceeds. This has been something that has been multiple years in the making. It was always the plan as the second piece of the uh, housing production fund, which we've talked about quite a bit, the $100 million fund uh, to support Housing Opportunities Commission and the uh, mixed income communities. Uh, this nonprofit preservation fund uh, will have this initial $20 million uh, hopefully by the end of this budget cycle to start next fiscal year, $50 million, which was always the initial plan uh, to help us to preserve at-risk naturally occurring affordable housing. Appreciate colleagues on the Planning, Housing, and Parks Committee pre uh, previously uh, on the Fed Committee, uh, worked very closely with uh, Councilmember Reamer on this and just wanted to acknowledge uh, his efforts and his work. Want to thank DHCA and HOC and all of our housing partners. It took several years for us to work through how we could come up with a program that worked and figure out a way to fund it. Uh, we're finally there. That's really exciting. And so we didn't take a lot of time during this meeting to talk about this. But uh, once this is uh, fully up and operational, uh, which should be in a matter of uh, months, uh, this could help us to make the most significant dent in naturally occurring affordable housing that is at risk uh, of any local jurisdiction anywhere. And I think we all should be proud of that as one of the tools in our toolkit to address our uh, housing crisis. No one effort is going to move the needle in a way that we need it to, uh, but this will help significantly. And we have a bill later today, a zoning text amendment, uh, Council Vice President Stewart uh, and I have put forward that will be another tool uh, in the toolkit. So thank you to colleagues. Uh, thank you for all the collaboration. Uh, we have passed the consent calendar and all that's in it. And with that, we are adjourned until we return for public hearings at 1.30. All right.